Okay. First of all, I would like to welcome you to this uh, air and space seminar. It's a uh, it's a joint uh, joint venture of uh, Air Force Association uh, Norway and the uh, <coughs> Air Warfare section of the Swedish the Royal Swedish Academy of War Sciences and the Norwegian Defense Association. Uh, my name is uh, Ole Jan Holstoln. I'm the chairman of the Air Force Association Norway. <laughs> and I would just like to welcome you all, especially our uh, guests from uh, far away, all the Nordic countries. Thank you for uh, taking your time to come here today. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking. I will uh, give that uh, task over to uh, our uh, mastermind of this uh, seminar. So please, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel berg -Eriksen. Thanks, Ole uh, Generals, Admiral, uh, dearly esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, both uh, foreign and domestic. Um, I, have, uh, I was called mastermind by Ulian. I'm not sure if that is correct, but I will certainly try to do my very, uh, very best to guide you through uh, this wonderful seminar that we have planned for quite some time. It's a seminar I've been looking forward to and is quite uh, devoted to, uh, so looking forward to that. We have an absolutely uh, stunning lineup here today, and also you will have the pleasure of hearing my talk, uh, me speaking, unfortunately. Um, this seminar is the last contribution in a long line uh, of different contributions in the public debate regarding Nordic uh, cooperation, air power, and to some extent, uh, space. Uh, Luftled, uh, the latest version of the Air Force Association's uh, publication uh, looked like that, was pretty much completely devoted to this uh, topic and it included a lot of different perspectives and is well worth reading. Unfortunately, I'm afraid it might be sold out. Luckily, it's available digitally for everyone. In addition to that, there's been a long stream of uh, inputs on uh, both in social media and especially Stratagem. Uh, there's been a lot of different perspectives and we hope to continue that good tradition here uh, today. So, how is this set up? I've uh, set up the seminar in two waves and three sessions. Uh, the first wave, we will get a historical and military strategic perspective on the military cooperation from General Deason, followed by the Thank you. Uh, followed by a military theory and air power centric perspective from on the same cooperation and multi-domain operations from Dag Henriksen. <coughs> After that, we will delve a little bit into the current air cooperation status and associated opportunities, as well as offer um, a presentation on the flexible and resilient Nordic air base concept from Anders Pärsson. After that, we will go to lunch after this first very heavy wave. And after that, we will do a little bit more spacing. During the second wave, we will first do a section where we uh, will delve into some, something that is a little bit unknown to many of us uh, when Major, Major Willemsen will offer some insight and perspectives on what space can offer uh, the Nordic region before Vice Admiral Breckenridge will offer his perspective from an American technological and industry perspective. After that, we'll go and have some uh, much, much needed coffee before we go into the final session of the day. Um, with the backdrop of all the previous sessions, we will get national perspectives on all the topics from today, from, presented by Major General Sinderland from Norway, Brigadier General Persson from, uh, from Sweden, and Colonel Heikala from Finland. Unfortunately, Denmark were prevented from joining the debate. But as we have both Danish and Icelandic representatives here today in, in the hall, uh, I, we should be able to spark a good debate uh, to continue to shed light on the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead of us. And that is what we want to achieve here, um, an enlightened public debate that enables us to stride forward together to protect our countries, the Nordic region, and the alliance overall. Um, there is something different about this uh, air power seminar compared to others in um, that uh, the Air Force Association have uh, have provided, and that is that there will be 
no usual questions where you get to, to do a long introduction before the question is asked. Um, I'm very much, I'm very sorry about that, but it's unfortunately a necessity since we, uh, since we do have a live audience out in the world as well, and we do need to have the microphones working for that. So this is a very good number for you to write down right now. If you would like to write some questions, it'll be mentioned a couple of extra times. And if you're here, you can obviously just contact me and I will help you out with that. So send a text message with your question and your name. The good thing about it is that you don't need to remember your question all the way until uh, one of the inputs are, are completed. You can just send it to me straight away. Um, and I will deliver those questions from you uh, after the presentation, if time permits. And we will we'll try to come, continue, to, continue to do that. Um, and question selection is unfortunately the moderator's prerogative. So if your question is uh, very offensive um, or your name is not included, then it might not come up there. And that uh, remains my prerogative. Um, so. And also, if you are not too steady in uh, English, please write in uh, Norwegian, Danish, or Swedish. Uh, other languages might be diff difficult for me, but I'll try to translate as we, as we go. Um, and the same applies for the panel debate. Same, uh, same phone number to provide questions, and that will be, that will be laid by Major General Knudsen and uh, with support from, uh, from myself. So with that in mind, the phone number, uh, let's, go, uh, let's go over to the actual program itself. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, but the uh, Chatham House rules apply as usual for this uh, seminar. That brings us over to the first presentation of today. Um, we will have a presentation called Nordic Military Corporation Origins and Way Ahead. will be presented by uh, General Sverdisen. He served as a Norwegian Chief of Defense from 1st of April 2005 to 30 September 2009. He has a very strong military background, also a master in, in uh, science in civil engineering from Uni Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and is currently a research fellow at the Norwegian Defense and Research Establishment uh, within the Strategic Analysis and Joint Systems Division. General Deason remains a powerful voice in the public discourse on defense issues over many years. I could think of few better to open the seminar for us uh, today. General, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much indeed for the invitation. When I came down here this morning, I was actually expecting to be uh, shown up into the old artillery magazine upstairs, but I see you have gone to extraordinary length to make a foot slogger like me uh, feeling at home by putting us here in the Hall of Infantry Regimental Colors. So thank you for that. Um, what I'm going to do is to take you back uh, 15 years or so to the birth of the Nordic military cooperation in its sort of modern sense. Um, and since I consider myself one of the founding fathers of that cooperation, um, I think it, it's only uh, natural that we should uh, try to take a look at what the world looked like uh, at that stage, because um, the opportunities that we are facing today with the NATO uh, enlargement uh, were not at all present at that time. Uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, 2006, when the first talks between uh, the then Swedish Chief of Defense, Håkan Syrien, and myself started, uh, Vladimir Putin had not yet held his uh, uh, famous or rather infamous speech at the Munich Security Conference. Uh, the Georgian conflict had not occurred, nor had, of course, the Russian annexation of Crimea or the, the war in Ukraine. So Swedish and Finnish non-alignment um, were uh, very strictly observed, uh, and there was no way we could take this cooperation into the operational realm, uh, or at least not to any great extent anyway. But Norway, Sweden, and Finland in particular shared the same financial problem, which I have called uh, the problem of the marginal defense force. And I will come back to that in a moment. <clears throat> 
And this is a problem which applies to a uh, lesser extent to Denmark because of different geopolitical circumstances, and I'll come back to that a bit later as well. But um, I'm afraid I'll have to bore you with a, a graph and a, and a few observations on, on defense um, economics. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, of course, that the cost of a modern defense force can actually be split in, in two types of cost. Uh, they are the costs pertaining to logistics and support functions, such as bases, infrastructure, simulators, uh, spare parts, workshops, and all these boring things you need before you can actually go operational. And then, of course, you have the costs pertaining to the actual activity. Uh, operating ships, planes, and uh, battalions, and whatnot. And you can see on the graph that the cost of the support functions will sort of increase independently of the number of units you have, because this is a sort of basic investment you have to do. And then, of course, the cost will increase with each new unit that you're operating. Uh, now, uh, interestingly, uh, when you downsize your forces, scale them down, which is what we have been doing for most of the time over the last few decades anyway, uh, you can see that the reduction in the actual number of units uh, is far greater than the reduction in the cost of support functions. And this is actually reasonable. I mean, if you want to operate submarines, for example, uh, they demand a unique both technical and tactical uh, skill uh, competencies, uh, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. Whether you have four or six of them uh, doesn't really matter in terms of, of, the, of the cost of the support functions, uh, not to, to, to any great degree anyway. So the, the cost of the support functions decreases only marginally when the number of units is reduced, which means, of course, when you divide that cost on the remaining number of units, you see that the cost per remaining unit increases hyperbolically uh, when the number becomes small. So the impact on your unit costs of losing two units uh, is vastly different if you start with 20 compared to starting with five. And in actual fact, sustaining the entire spectrum of weapon platforms and systems and, and units and capabilities uh, in a modern defense force on a national basis alone means that we spend an increasing part of the budget on support functions. So in fact, we get a very limited return on our investment. And this is not something we can do anything about. I mean, this is just you know the, the, th the way things are. <clears throat> so running a small defense force is actually not a very cost-effective way of doing business. It means that we acquire less and less defense capability for the same amount of money, even when the budgets are actually keeping track of the costs. So nothing to do with the budgets as such. It's simply the, the, the financial structure of, of any given defense force. So the only way we can break out of this prison is some kind of multinational defense cooperation to reduce unit costs and to acquire economy of scale. Um, and this, ladies and gentlemen, it was in 2006 the only way, and it remains the only way. And I, I sense that today there's a lot of optimism going around because we now can do all sorts of cooperation, not just on, on an economic basis, but uh, operational as well with the NATO enlargement. That does not mean and should not be taken to mean that this has become any less necessary. Rather the contrary, we still are facing uh, a major, I would say, financial challenge, trying to acquire a reasonable return on our defense investment, which makes this as necessary today as it was 15 years ago. Now, there are two ways of integrating or coordinating our defense effort. Uh, one is specialization, which means basically that we share the workload. And if you want to have that sort of concept on steroids, um, you could say that Finland will look after the Army, Sweden will look after the Air Force, and Norway will look after the Navy. 
Uh, now that, of course, is a, is a joke, even if I every now and then have come across uh, some of our American friends who seem to think that this is actually a good idea, which obviously it is when you look at the world with American eyes and, and with their sort of yardstick. Um, and the only uh, example I can think of, of of this principle actually being um, put into effect is the fact that I think it was something like 15 years ago, the New Zealanders took a took a look at their air force and said, well, the nearest non-English speaking nation is something like 3,000 miles away. Are we going to, to uh, stay with a fighter uh, air force? Uh, or should we let the Australians do it? Uh, interestingly, the Australians have never confirmed that they are going to do that, but it is sort of tacitly understood that this is what they're going to do. However, uh, it obviously wouldn't work in, in our case, so the alternative is what we call integration. Now, integration can be implemented at various levels. Uh, the C-17 initiative, for example, with strategic airlift, where NATO has uh, invested in, in uh, a fleet of C-17 cargo planes and the countries that do not need or cannot afford to have their own strategic airlift will buy into this uh, joint fleet simply by paying into the till and then uh, getting a certain number of flight hours in return. Uh, you can do the, this at the functional level uh, like the Baltic countries do with their joint uh, staff and defense college in Tartu, Estonia. Or you can go all the way to the service level, and if you look at the two mine counter measure vessels, the top of the slide, uh, they are completely similar, identical. One is Dutch and one is Belgian. One has a Dutch flag, one has a Belgian flag. Other than that, they are completely similar. The design, the maintenance, uh, and, and all the support and logistic systems are identical, but they have national flags. Uh, so, uh, if we try then to put Nordefco, uh, as we envisaged it 15 years ago, into this kind of schematic, uh, this is what it would look like. Oops, uh, there we go. Håkan um, uh, and I, and, and uh, as we expanded the, uh, the, the project also, Admiral Koskiala from Finland and uh, General Helse in, in Denmark, we're actually looking at a kind of functional integration where force generation, any aspect of force generation, procurement, maintenance, uh, staff training, bases, and so on and so forth, would be joint, whereas for obvious reasons at, at that time, uh, we would have completely separate national forces, air, maritime, ground, uh, as well as uh, C2. Um, and the, the interesting thing is, it, well, I should perhaps say at this stage that this never happened. I mean, uh, Nordefco, compared to the sort of vision at the time, Nordefco, uh, to my mind, has been a spectacular failure. Uh, in the sense that it has not produced anything like this sort of, of, of concept. And the, the reason for that, of course, is that, uh, first of all, there's been a, a lot of, of friction uh, against this within the, the, the Scandinavian militaries themselves, uh, which is only natural, coming to think of it. But also, uh, one of the difficult things with this scheme is that it it actually means that we will, to a certain extent at least, have to use the same major weapon platforms and systems. And, and that, of course, means sacrificing political freedom of action when it comes to military procurement, which is always a difficult exercise. And there has been uh, not the sufficient political will to, to do that. Uh, however, how do things look uh, today? Well, slightly, I would be uh, a bit more optimistic today because what we can actually expect today <coughs> with uh, the NATO enlargement uh, is, of course, that it now becomes possible to have not only joint force generation, but also, to a certain extent, partly integrated forces uh, because of the NATO enlargement. So we can push this red line upwards 
uh, and, and become even more uh, joint uh, as we go along. However, as I was just uh, emphasizing, that does not mean that we can afford to any greater degree uh, to miss the opportunity of, of going further with the uh, logistic and support functions. And it all again comes back to the return on our defense investment. Uh, changing the perspective to the operational and strategic sphere, I think it has over the last few months uh, become uh, almost a truism, or more or less like sort of kicking in open doors to, uh, uh, to say that the strategic properties of the Scandinavian peninsula uh, are changing, and uh, this, this peninsula, uh, north of the Baltic and east of the, uh, the North Sea, uh, is of course uh, a vast place, it's thinly populated, it's on Russia's rim, uh, it has limited communications, and particularly so north of the Arctic Circle. Um, it's isolated from the European continent, so strategically speaking, although geographically we are a a, uh, an isthmus or, or a, uh, a peninsula, strategically speaking, we are an island. We can only be reinforced by a major power with the capability to project power over the ocean, which for all practical purposes today uh, only applies to the United States of America. Uh, and this, of course, is uh, where I come back to Denmark, as I promised to do. Uh, and um, at the risk of offending some of our Danish friends, uh, I have to say that Denmark is obviously a Scandinavian country in terms of its language, history, culture, political culture, and all the rest of it. However, geographically, or geopolitically, I should say, geopolitically and strategically, Denmark is not a Scandinavian country. Uh, it is not uh, isolated from the uh, European continent. It's not on Russia's rim. It, has, uh, it does not have limited communications, um, and so on and so forth. So it is an easily reinforceable country attached to the European continent, uh, which is why I'm going to concern myself uh, more or less only with the uh, three countries on the peninsula, Finland, Sweden, and Norway, for the rest of my uh, presentation. Uh, and um, uh, Karl Johan, or King Charles the Fourteenth, I think you prefer to call him in, in Sweden, who was no mean strategist. I mean, at the end of the day, he was a, a marshal of France. Uh, and he pointed out that this um, connection between Denmark and Norway, uh, which was in force at the time, is a complete an uh, anomaly. Uh, it is Norway and Sweden, and in Sweden at that time he also included Finland, uh, again for obvious reasons. Um, it is Norway and Sweden which needs to be allied in order to balance Russian influence in Scandinavia, and to a certain extent that was absolutely right. So what happens at the moment with the NATO enlargement is that finally, after hundreds of years, uh, politics become consistent with the creation of the good Lord. Uh, in other words, we can actually shape a security policy and a strategy which is consistent with uh, geography and then the way we have been designed by the, uh, the creator. Um, and this means, of course, that uh, the strategic balance in the Nordic-Baltic space is changing and, and drastically so in NATO's uh, favor. Um, the impact on the Russian sort of risk gain assessment, uh, and again I'm at the risk of, of kicking in open doors because this has been stated uh, more or less over and over again over the last few months. The Baltic becomes a NATO lake, um, which means that the operations and the future operations of the Baltic fleet will be severely restricted to the extent that there will be such a thing as the Baltic fleet. And it's going to be very interesting to see how the Russians will develop uh, the Baltic fleet over the next decade or so. <coughs> Given the, <coughs> the, the, the challenging air situation that this fleet is going to change in, in a conflict. Then, of course, <coughs> there is the NATO nightmare scenario of a Russian land grab towards the Baltic republics, 
which becomes a totally different proposition once Sweden and Finland joins NATO, <clears throat> with uh, 150 combat aircraft coming into the bargain on the NATO side, operating from two vast aircraft carriers north and west of the theater of operations, and finally, and interestingly, political pressure on, uh, or for that matter, a military coup or fait accompli of some sort on one of the Scandinavian countries uh, without actually involving all three of them it becomes a rather less feasible proposition again. Um, so there is no way they can create a war which is too small <clears throat> or rather too big for each of us, but too small for NATO. That, that probability will go <clears throat> down in my, in my opinion. So how will NATO think about uh, this? I think it, it's quite clear that for NATO this will be one strategic region, but there will be two separate uh, theaters of operation and possibly two joint force command headquarters to uh, command them. Finland, of course, will be the significantly most exposed country and uh, uh, the main reinforcement challenge where they are situated. So although this simplifies planning, it also increases the requirement uh, quite drastically. Uh, so by implication, NATO's attention center of gravity, if there is such a thing as a, an attention center of gravity, but for want of a better word, NATO's attention center of gravity will change from, um, shall we say, uh, the north, I mean, in, in Norway, we are used to seeing ourselves as NATO, the NATO in the north, and consequently, NATO's, a lot of NATO's attention in this part of the world has been focused on, on the high north. Now, this will probably change, and, and the, the, the changing focus to Finland as the major challenge will, by implication, carry a change of focus in, in terms of, of NATO's political and military uh, attention. Uh, so, uh, even if one of our previous defense ministers uh, was very uh, keen to talk about Norway as NATO in the north, that is no longer the situation, and we will have to live with, with that. We are becoming a strategic rare area, albeit with a forward northern flank in, in Finnmark, but other than that, we are actually changing uh, within this, this new strategic entity. Um, and for more or less the same reason, uh, the Norwegian high north focus um, will not, uh, or we will have to realize that, the, the, uh, that both Sweden and Finland are Baltic countries with uh, a focus centered on the, the Baltic and the, the southern seaboard of the Baltic Sea. Uh, for obvious reasons. And uh, this also is uh, consistent with the way we have distributed our forces. Uh, so if you look at where we have our centers of gravity in terms of where we have uh, the majority of our best trained, best equipped forces, we have ours in the high north, whereas both Sweden and Finland have their centers of gravity in the south, or in the central and southern part of both countries. And this may look a bit like a, a bad point of departure for creating a joint strategy or a joint concept of operations. But in actual fact, I think this may in many ways be um, a bonus or a, a good place to start, precisely because we are small countries with vast areas to look after. We need some kind of complementary division of labor. Um, and a complementary distribution of forces. So if we look at it this way, um, from the perspective of South Norway, we will be better screened, better, shall we say, protected uh, than we have been ever before uh, in our history, literally. Um, and we will be able to focus even more uh, or to, to focus even more on, on the high north. Uh, whereas in, in Sweden and Finland, uh, they will have, if not a vacuum, they will have uh, an interest in, in uh, joining in some kind of joint concept of operations. Uh, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment, because I think the, the, the major challenge here 
uh, is precisely the defense of the Scandinavian peninsula north of the polar circle. Um, so this allows this different focus allows for an economy of force based defense concept. That's what I'm saying, really. And that, of course, is what we need in order to create some kind of strategic synergy, which is a capability that is greater than the sum of its national parts. Uh, why is that important, ladies and gentlemen? Well, it is important because I think the world around us is also changing, and, and the, the war in Ukraine is a, uh, the case in point. Uh, because the most important effect in the longer term of the war for the United States uh, is the impact on Russo-Chinese relations. And the fact that we have concurrently a confrontation between the United States and China and a war uh, between the West led by the United States and Russia can only serve to bring China and Russia closer together based on a sort of my enemy's enemy is my friend kind of logic. Um, However, uh, the United States, for all their economic and military might, uh, cannot balance both revisionist powers to prevail in both strategic directions, both the Indo-Pacific and Europe. They can only do that by building alliances uh, both in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific. And I think it, it was um, President Obama who said, and that was um, appropriately in a speech to the Air Force Academy cadets in the United States back in 2008 or something. He said, uh, the United States remained the one indispensable nation in world affairs. Now that has been severely criticized, obviously, both in the US and outside. But his foreign secretary, Madeleine Albright, rephrased uh, that sentence and said, the United States is the one indispensable partner in world affairs. And I think uh, that is a very precise way of summing it up, really. Uh, the United States cannot do everything alone, but nobody can do anything without the United States. Um, and uh, that being said, um, the Americans have been of the opinion for at least 20 years that we, the Europeans, should do more to look after our own security. And indeed, we are capable of that if we spend our money sufficiently and, and, or uh, effectively and, and spend uh, enough of it. Um, and the Americans uh, were convinced about that even when we thought that Russia was a rather more formidable force than they turn out to be. And you can only guess what the Americans will think when it comes to that sort of question after Russia had di di displayed uh, the sort of weakness that they are displaying as we speak uh, in the Ukraine. Um, so that will uh, impact on America's uh, assessment of burden sharing, uh, not to our advantage, I should say. Uh, and uh, Professor Stephen Walt, who is uh, a celebrated neo-realist uh, political scientist uh, at Harvard University, um, has put it this way, in Europe, the United States should move from the first responder to the defender of last resort. We will remain in Europe with our nuclear umbrella and, and uh, token conventional forces, perhaps, but you, the Europeans, you will have to carry a bigger part of the white man's burden, which I suppose is a highly politically incorrect sort of phrase, but anyway, um, uh, because we will have to focus, we the Americans will have to focus on, on the Indo-Pacific and Asia. And Stephen Wald, I mean, this is not, ladies and gentlemen, this is not sort of Donald Trump raving and ranting. This is mainstream political and military American considered opinion. So it's not something we can afford to say that's not going to happen. Uh, and that is why I think, ladies and gentlemen, the war and all wars are great catalysts for trends that are already there. And this war will accelerate the US expectations of greater European responsibility for their own security. And the only way we can achieve that in Scandinavia, and I suggest a very profitable way that we can achieve that in Europe, um, is a kind of defense integration of the type I have been uh, suggesting. Um, indeed, that is the only viable way of meeting this expectation and this requirement on a regional basis. Uh, unless we want to spend a phenomenal amount of money, which we uh, do not. Uh, what about the high north? And I was, 
mentioning this uh, a couple of slides ago, <coughs> the defense problem of the high north. Uh, the Scandinavian peninsula north of the polar circle is the fact that the, the total amount of real estate uh, in this area is more or less the same as to the Norwegian mainland. So 320 something thousand square kilometers. In this area, there is one, ladies and gentlemen, one brigade size mobile army formation, which is the Norwegian Brigade in Troms. There is a Finnish brigade in Sodankule, but that is a training unit. They do not exist as a formation in wartime. They are just training conscripts for other parts of the Finnish mobilization force. So in the whole of this area, there is this one single uh, mechanized brigade. And the ratio, consequently, of time and space to available forces, which is, of course, a classic in, in strategic assessment, uh, precludes any sort of maneuver warfare by ground forces in this vast area. All the more so because communications, the communications that these formations would have to move along are severely uh, restricted and, and, of course, then very, it's very predictable where they would have to travel. Uh, if you look at the geometry from the uh, peacetime garrisons of this one Norwegian brigade to the Norwegian-Russian border, you have 900 kilometers from uh, the same area to the Russo-Finnish border, the southern uh, approach, the alakuti sala uh, axis uh, in, in northern Finland, it's 700 kilometers, um, and the base of the triangle from the northernmost to the southernmost possible Russian axis, you have uh, 600 kilometers. Uh, and this brings out my point, really, uh, which is that uh, you, you cannot have a defense concept in this area uh, which is joint and based on uh, ground forces. And, and that's, I mean, that's not a matter of opinion, that's a matter of physics. So the requirement here is for a concept which means that we can move fires without moving platforms. We must be able to shift fires from one place to another without actually having to move the platforms, which is the thing you cannot do with tanks. Um, and I'm not saying this, ladies and gentlemen, I'm letting me emphasize that. I'm not saying this to suck up to the present company. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm on record as having said this before, so I, I think I can uh, safely say that this, this is, again, we're coming back to, to the laws of physics. And, and if you want to compensate for vast distances, great spaces, uh, few units, and the requirement to shift fires uh, without shifting forces, then you need platforms that have long range, high speed, and the ability to deliver uh, precision guided weapons, which is, to my mind, another way of saying combat aircraft. So, uh, initially, uh, the defense of this vast area can only be based on a concept, uh, this will be an air campaign, basically, at the beginning, anyway. And it uh, can only be mastered with a, a concept based on, on air power, supplemented, of course, by uh, Finnish territorial defense forces. And I, I don't think it's very likely that Finland will change their defense concepts simply because they join NATO. Uh, the Finnish defense concept of mass mobilization and a huge ground force uh, is going to stay with us, despite the fact that the reason for this has always been, as the Finns have been saying, Finland must be able to stand alone. Uh, we will never get uh, help from the outside. Now, as they have now, <laughs> by definition, <laughs> signed up to the fact that they think they will get help from the outside, it's going to be very interesting to see if this is going to impact on their actual concept. I don't think so, not in the short term anyway. So, so uh, if we can envisage a concept with, with uh, Finnish territorial defense forces deployed uh, along the Russo-Finnish uh, border, um, then anything to, to create depth behind that and to create 
the ability to concentrate firepower in one place, you will need a, a, an air-based uh, concept of operations. Uh, so the first step towards an enhanced Scandinavian defense capability, not just to improve and raise, raise the threshold of, of Russian aggression, but also to meet the expectations from our primary ally will have to be an integrated air defense concept for the entire Arctic area of operations within NATO, which means that we need to look at the planes, the bases, the ground-based air defenses, and the command and control as, as an entity, as, as one thing. Um, and if that doesn't turn me lunch, I don't know what I would have to do. Um, so, uh, but, but what this means is, of course, that uh, we will have to sacrifice that level of ambition called control, uh, which means uh, holding on to every square meter of real estate. And the difficulty with that is that in, in the public domain, there is a perception that defense in its political and strategic sense uh, is equivalent to tactical defense with ground forces holding ground. They don't see the difference between defense as a political and strategic terms, and defense as a face of war, as a tactical uh, instrument. Um, and this is where, it's where it becomes difficult to sell politically a concept which is not based on holding ground, but based on punishing the enemy, as long as he is located in, in that or on that piece of ground. That, ladies and gentlemen, was basically what I was planning to say. Um, and again, if, if that doesn't uh, earn me lunch in this congregation, I, I, I really wonder what it takes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, sir. Um, I am now waiting for your questions to pop up, and the number is plus four seven. 91789792. Hopefully, you already have that. And now I'm buying you at least a minute or two to send in your extra questions. But I'll start with one myself. Uh, you noted that integration is basically the only way, and I completely agree. Uh, this is the way. Um, what are the most likely potential showstoppers for this integration from your perspective? And I'm particularly thinking of the air domain. Uh, if I may digress momentarily to answer that. Uh, some years ago, in fact, uh, quite a number of years ago, uh, Tony Blair's government uh, in the United Kingdom uh, decided that they would reform the upper house of the British Parliament, the House of Lords, uh, and they would effectively chuck out a number of the hereditary lords, those who have inherited their titles, being sort of the fifth baron something or other, or the second earl of whatever. Um, and only a few hereditary lords would remain. Uh, so the government put this in the speech which the Queen reads to uh, the Parliament on the opening, pretty much like uh, the King will do here in Norway. Uh, the only thing being that the Queen or the monarch in the United Kingdom is denied access to the House of Commons. Uh, and again, there is a quaint British tradition, a reason for that, of course, going back to Cromwell's time. Um, so she reads the speech in the House of Lords, in the presence of their lordships, in their sort of ermine coats and crowns and all the rest of it. And when she came to this passage that uh, we are going to reform the House of Lords by chucking out the uh, hereditary lords, there was a certain unrest along the benches, uh, not surprisingly. Um, so a lot of British newspapers wrote that um, we find this outrageous. I mean, this is a very inappropriate demonstration against Her Majesty because she is only reading the speech which the Prime Minister gives her. Um, uh, the Economist newspaper, uh, on the other hand, wrote that this newspaper find this entirely predictable uh, because when you tell a bunch of turkeys that Christmas is imminent, uh, what can you expect? Uh, and in many ways, defense integration is more or less the same thing. Uh, and one of the things Håkan Sirene and I discussed, we're actually having a joint uh, Nordic staff college. 
uh, because they were doing more or less the same thing. Finland and Sweden had confirmed the NATO standards in their sort of uh, training of officers at that level. Um, and the obvious candidate uh, uh, was the uh, Defence College in Stockholm, being the, uh, the best resourced and, and most prestigious, uh, academically the best uh, alternative. However, if you want to uh, disband the staff college here at Dr. Seuss and say we're going to, uh, to Stockholm instead with the course, uh, you need to ask them, I mean, what, what are the practical implications of this? And, and uh, then you, you're not likely to get uh, an enthusiastic answer. Yes, right, let's close shop and move to Stockholm. Brilliant, excellent. Um, of course not. And, and this is where I, I come to, to, to your question. Uh, any kind of, of rationalization, any kind of you know, creating some kind of synergy means that people are going to lose their jobs, uh, service or garrisons are going to be closed, bases are going to be closed, people will have to move, jobs will disappear, and so on and so forth. Now, there is no military organization on the planet which is going to embrace that enthusiastically. So, what I would say to those of you who are going to, to implement a future Scandinavian integrated defense concept in one way or another, you are going to face enormous internal friction. Uh, and it's going to take chiefs of defense that are prepared to become extremely unpopular in their own service in order to do that, as well as uh, politicians and defense ministers that are prepared uh, to do whatever it takes. So the government will have to be one with a strong majority in parliament behind it. And the defense minister must not have any plans to become mayor in one of those local municipalities, depending uh, on the presence of the, uh, of the defense. So, so um, that, that's just the way things are. I mean, when you, when you try to push through this sort of thing, uh, heads will have to roll and blood's, blood will have to be spilled. Thank you very much. The second question is coming from Major Vesetru from the Norwegian Air Force. Um, in a scenario post-Ukraine war with a weak and defeated Russia, what will be the role of the Scandinavian countries, especially with regard to a China-US conflict? I'm not sure I got quite the essence of that question. Can you? So in a scenario post the Ukraine war, considering that that will have ended in some way with, uh, if not defeated, at least weakened Russia, what will be the role of the Scandinavian countries if a China-US conflict arise? Right. Uh, well, uh, as far as I can see, it's off the top of my head. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> we're not going to have a role in that. I, I, First of all, I don't think our politicians are, are going to sort of uh, go for uh, that sort of, of involvement in a, in a conflict in Asia. And quite frankly, I, I don't see what, what or that the Americans uh, would be uh, uh, expecting us to. I mean, they might expect us to do something, something else in, in terms of like they did, for example, after 9-11. I mean, supporting the United States in, in various ways other than in the actual theater of operations. But, but I, I don't think we would make, uh, even when you put the Scandinavian countries resources or expeditionary resources with a reach towards the Indo-Pacific, no. even when you put them together, I don't think we would uh, make a difference. Uh, not, not a big one anyway. So, so um, and of course, a, a war between the United States and China over Taiwan would be a maritime, a maritime slash air war. Uh, so uh, either way, it would mean deploying uh, aircraft, essentially. Uh, I mean, it's the only practical thing we could do. But quite frankly, I don't see that there will be a, a political uh, agreement to do that, nor do I see uh, any sort of uh, requirement uh, from, from the United States for us to do that. All right, thank you. Uh, the third question comes from Jan Koski from Norfolk Grumman. How does Greenland 
integrate into the regional strategy on Nordic cooperation? Well, that's a hard one, and, and I, I, I'm not going to pretend that I have thought about that. So, so I will leave it to the Danish representatives in the audience to, to, to answer that, if they have an answer to it off the top of their heads again. Um, but but it, it's quite obvious that a place the size of Greenland will have, to, will have some kind of role to play, uh, but what that should be, to what extent the United States, with their present presence on the island should come into it, or, or and the, the house and wise and where force, uh, I, I will not uh, hazard an opinion. Thank you. Well, uh, I've, uh, based on the vigorous head shaking of the Danish representative in the audience, I think we will leave that one for later, but we note this down as important for sure. We have a fourth question that's just coming in um, uh, from one of the Swedish delegates, Peter Greberg. Uh, he notes that you were speaking of the strategic environment and two theater of operations. Are we actually able to separate the high north and the Baltic Sea region when Finland and Sweden now joins NATO, linking the two areas together? And if so, what does that mean for the Nordic countries, if you were able to catch the essence of that? Well, if I read you correctly, I mean, the, there is, of course, the, uh, you have this Arctic high north area of operations, you then have the Baltic area operations, and then you have this, this um, piece of, of land with the Russian-Finnish border uh, connecting them. And, and what about that sort of, of operational vacuum, if, if I read the question correctly? Uh, but, but what I'm saying is uh, these two theaters of operation, uh, I think, uh, that's how NATO is going to, to, to see this, and that's how they are going to approach this conceptually. Uh, for us, the, the Scandinavian countries, um, as, as a regional group, and, and of course, uh, in particular, Finland, we will obviously have to have some idea what we are going to do about you know, this, this, this uh, long border. Um, and you, you might argue that uh, it's not very likely uh, that, I mean, the, the strategic interests of Russia are also, to a certain extent, connected with either the Baltic, the Baltic countries, uh, the uh, the access of the uh, the Baltic fleet to the to the sea, and so on and so forth, and also in the high north because of the the uh, uh, Kola bases and the uh, and submarine-based uh, nuclear deterrent. Uh, the so the the strategic interests of the Russians. Uh, are also connected with, with specifically with these two uh, areas. So it, it, it rather depends on uh, what sort of threat assessment are we going to have for that sort of intervening uh, piece of real estate. Uh, and either way, we, we will have to, to prioritize, again going back to the, the ratio of space and time to available forces, we will have to prioritize. We will have to make some sacrifices. Uh, and, and my suggestion is this is where we are probably going to do it. But again, that being said, uh, that does not mean that we will not have to think through it uh, and see, I mean, what if the Russians do something precisely uh, because of that, because it is unpredictable? What if they do something in that area in order to preclude Finnish and Swedish reinforcement uh, turning to the Baltic? for example. Uh, so, uh, but again, uh, no hard and fast answers, but, but again, we're up against the old problem of, of uh, priorities. Excellent. Uh, thank you, sir, for all your, for your presentation and for having uh, another big hand for General Deason, please. Before I introduce you, Doug, I will uh, just give a quick reminder of how the program looks. And if you forgot to note down the number, now you know the rules of the game. And uh, there it is so one more time. I'll leave it up while I'm giving Doug his well-deserved introduction.
So, our next speaker has um, an operational background from air surveillance and control system, same as myself and one of the later speakers today, with deployments from Baltics and Afghanistan. He is currently both a lieutenant colonel and a professor, head of research and development at the Royal Norwegian Air Force Academy. He has a PhD from the University of Glasgow and uh, is a professor in air power. He is one of very few with that particular competence. And with that, uh, I think I'm sure you will provide some useful perspectives uh, on uh, both the air power centric, from an air power centric perspective and uh, from in a multi-domain world. Doug, please, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Generals, admirals, colleagues, and thank you so much for asking me to say a few words on this seminar. This is pretty much what I'm being asked to talk about. Um, the, oh, doesn't sound that, the conceptual framework for North Nordic military operations. It's kind of takeaways or what we were discussing at the Air Power Seminar a couple of months ago. So um, I was thinking about this task, um, the conceptual framework. So what I'm going to talk about is if we're going to uh, make the military um, cooperation that we are all in this room at least, uh, want to achieve what kind of military theory or military concepts are going to govern that development. Um, and uh, this was partly the topic of the seminar in uh, Trondheim a couple of months ago. Um, and the title of the seminar was The Battle for the Ocean, the Development of Air-Sea Cooperation in a New Strategic Landscape. Okay, why did we choose that particular uh, topic? Well, partly because many of us is slightly tired of uh, the rather dogmatic approach to Norwegian military strategy. To the degree there is a Norwegian military strategy, it seems to be this. Um, a lot of us think there's a number of other things we're going to use the military force in Norway to, and Nordic cooperation, surely. Um, so we wanted to explore the other options. Surely, um, the changing strategic conditions influence the way we're going to think about air power. Um, I've been in the Air Force for more than 30 years, and I think every year I've heard that we are now living in an entirely different strategic reality, which, we, of course, we don't. Uh, but it's changing. The conditions are changing, um, which we're going to talk more about later on. Uh, as General Deason eloquently um, informed us, um, the Nordic nation lives on a peninsula, um, which means that air-sea cooperation is really important. So in terms of logistics or getting assistance, uh, it has to come from the west, it has to come via air or sea. Um, here are the four ports that we have agreed upon is the essential ones, at least for now. <laughs> and surely this. I'm not quite sure if the Norwegian Navy is going to change their modus operandi all that much. I'm not sure. Um, I think we need to have a more robust or thorough debate what the Norwegian Army is going to do in a Nordic cooperation. In terms of the Air Forces, I would really argue for a strong, strong integration and cooperation, which I'm going to come back to later. But for now, um, I'm actually unsure how many of today's variants of uh, of the, of, the, of the grip and we're going to stay after you get the 60 next generation grip and I'm not sure. 60 in 60 of the of the regular ones at, in addition to that? Exactly. So that means we're going to have in a few years well more than 250 capable fighters in the Nordic nations. Uh, and if you combine the uh, allied resources um, just close to the Baltic Sea or the, uh, or the North Sea uh, depicted on the, on the bottom left corner, we're going to have, well, three, four, 450 really, really capable fighter assets just close to this region. Yeah? Which means, if, you, if you're going to have some questions afterwards for me, please focus on this one. Um, because I'm not supposed to talk all that much about this, but more about Milton Wayne, but I would really like to, uh, because I do think this is a really, really good idea. 
not only to have secure communications lines between each nation, but to actually sit together, learn how uh, each of a strategic outlook uh, is, um, create competence, a, a full understanding of the, the, the total um, area of responsibility. Uh, establishing a Nordic or an Arctic area center would be quite something. Okay, if we do, if we do that, what are the military concepts that are going to govern the way forward? Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about two of them: military domain operations and air sea battle. Uh, air sea battle, we don't use that term that much. Um, when in Norway we are thinking about air sea integration, we didn't find a really good alternative, and so we're going to keep the air sea battle for now. Okay, so I'm going to say a few words about that. So. Uh, what is multi-domain operations and what is the air-sea battle? Um, try to put these concepts into a broader perspective and say something about how that's going to influence Norway and the Nordic cooperation um, moving forward. It seems to me like multi-domain is really, really the new wine. Um, I think in Norway at least, uh, just before Christmas, Everything just changes names. So the pizza becomes Christmas pizza. Um, the sausages suddenly becomes Christmas sausages and so forth. And now it seems everything is multi-domain now. So it's multi-domain uh, command and control. It's multi-domain targeting. It's multi-domain ISR. Um, and even the slides are fifth generation and fancy. It's like my eyes are watering just looking at my own slide. So multi-domain then, the orchestration of military activities across all domains and all environments synchronized with non-military activities to enable the alliance to deliver converging effects at the speed of relevance. Wouldn't that be something? Okay, but before we get to the uh, multi-domain, uh, let's talk a little bit about air sea battle. So, uh, what is the air-sea battle really? Uh, well, it came in the yeah, uh, plus minus 2010. Um, it is not a strategy. They're quite clear on that. It's not a strategy. It's not a military theory of some sort. Um, it's a concept rooted um, uh, intellectually uh, in the airland battle that was uh, that was developed in the 1970s and implemented in the 1980s. Um, which in by nature is not only air and sea, and they're quite explicit, it's a multi-domain kind of approach, yeah. Um, it is, oh, sorry. It is a concept that was designed really, we're talking about China here. So uh, how is uh, the US gonna approach China, which means it's, it's a long way from the, from the US continent, so um, a rising China, ever more um, robust, technologically advanced, uh, and you're going to fight at their turf, so to speak, okay? So how to do that? How to knock down the door, as they say, to take down the A2AD systems um, and win the war? Across domain operations, all uh, domains, um, with the emphasis on China and the emphasis on um, A2AD systems, Around 2014, 2015, they stopped using the term, and someone who does not work in Apple or uh, Microsoft came up with a name, Joint Concept for Access to Maneuver in the Global Commons, uh, which none of us remember anymore, so we go back to the ERC battle because it's easier to remember, yeah? So, um, the ERC was a kind of a cooperation based pretty much on, on, on the foundation of the Ellen battle, uh, Air and Navy, uh, and later on, uh, the Army, watching the, uh, the Air Force and the Navy come up with the air-sea battle, came up with their uh, sort of solution, which was multi-domain operations. So there's a, there's, a, there's a common thread going from airline battle to air-sea battle, and now we're talking about multi-domain operations. Uh, so I think 
the debated view it now is that the concept of the air-sea battle would be within the multi-domain organization, it's not the other way around, yeah? So part of the whole multi-domain would be an air-sea battle kind of concept. So, but as all military concepts, I think we can just relax a little bit because I'm, I'm kind of, I, I never stop wondering about all the officers who every time there's a new concept arriving, stand up in front of the audience and say, this is really, this is it. This is gonna change the way we think about war, which I don't think it is. So we can, surely we can have a cup of coffee and relax a little bit when we approach these concepts. Have a piece of chocolate. So, to what degree do multi-domain operations represent something qualitatively new? Because I think that question needs to be addressed since so many people are addressing it now. So many people are using it as if it was something that's really gonna change the way we think about war. Um, a way of looking at it would be like this. So every two, three, four, five years, another concept arrives, um, and now it's multi-domain. The US Air Force are using joint all domain slightly, which makes the whole thing slightly confusing. Uh, and surely within two, three, four, or five years, another concept, the galactic <laughs> domain operations or something, and the stupid people back in 2023 20, who thought that multi-domain operations were something, yeah. Um, but I, I, uh, there's always interesting parts, relevant parts, important stuff in each of the concepts. So I'm not bad nothing or saying that we should not pay attention to multi-domain operations. We should. As we should all the different concepts because they contain elements, parts, that's really important. Uh, we're not going to buy the whole charade, yeah? Um, so there's all these new things or new ways of putting together old things. Um, okay, so multi-domain, is it, is that something to do with, I, I think, it's, I, I've been reading up, I'm pretty used to reading up on things, and, and reading up on multi-domain is, is hard. It's not easy to, to capture the very essence of multi-domain. Um, instead, I will try to describe it, um, I think it is more, more fruitful. Okay, so, it's about technology, it's about command and control, um, intelligence surveillance, we use the term C4 ISR now, um, to have a more rapid decision cycle. Surely we will integrate space and cyberspace, but space and cyberspace was, well, it, it didn't happen now. It has been integrated for quite some time, but it's more forceful or explicit uh, within the framework of multi-domains, and that's a good thing, but it's not something new really. Uh, we're standing in front of or in the middle of or within a digital transformation, so we should become a data-centric organization to exchange and exploit data to achieve objectives, yeah. I thought I was gonna put this one up. Uh, well, kind of a legend, legendary um, article um, by Admiral Owens, uh, in which he described the revolution in military affairs. Okay, so this is back in 1996, it is uh, almost 30 years ago. Okay, so what is revolution in military affairs? It's well-orchestrated contribution from all the military services, right? To know more about the flow of conflict and the opponent, so it's kind of about the OODA loop. To operate well within the decision cycle of the opponent, learning faster on the battlefield, adaptable, more flexible than the opponent. Sure. So if I put the definition of multi-domain up um, in the middle here, and I just picked out four, not randomly, but four other military concepts the past 30 years. Let's start with um, revolution military affairs. We've already seen the article about Owen, so I'm gonna move forward. So comprehensive approach. Um, the approach in Afghanistan, for instance. Okay, so we can find the same, um, the same approach, uh, the same words, um, how are we going to um, combine military and, and civilian tools to, to operate? Same goes for effects-based operations. The application of full range of military and non-military capabilities at all levels of conflict. So even the wording kind of looks familiar. Okay, the network-centric warfare. 
information superiority, networking sensors, decision making suitors, shared awareness, increased speed of command, higher tempo. Hmm. So in my mind, uh, the, multi, the, the, the very essence of multi-domain is, is, is bits and pieces of what we've been doing for the past 30 years. So what does this really mean? So if we do um, get any closer to understanding or winning future wars, if we understand or adjust ourselves to multi-domain, is multi-domain the kind of vehicle or what's going to take us to victory? I'm not so sure. I really, really I'm not so sure. Uh, the two central questions in military theory, arguably, would be what is war and how to win it? Which on the surface might look pretty simple or pragmatic or easy to answer. It is not. It is really, really difficult to answer. Um, and I think we've seen that uh, for the past 20, 25 years. I don't think the United States, when it entered the war in Iraq, fully understood what kind of war they were entering into. I think they struggled really finding out how to win it. The same goes for Afghanistan. They didn't understand what kind of war we entered into. And I think we struggled all the way to the very end trying to figure out how to win it. I don't think Putin understood what kind of war he was getting entangled in. I think there's many people in Russia right now who are trying to find out how to win it. So what we've been doing for decade after decade is really trying to build and refine the machine. And here I blame, uh, the blame would be a wrong word. Um, this goes for the Americans and the rest of us just follow the pursuit or the, or the lead of the Americans, yeah? So what we've been doing is trying to refine the machine all the time. We're polishing, we're sharpening the machine every single day. When I worked in um, Afghanistan, um, in the CDOC, the, the Joint Operations Center, um, the average time from uh, troops in contact um, uh, until a bomb was on target, it was 18 minutes. A few years later, um, the average time was below 10 minutes. Continuously sharpening, polishing the machine. What we spend less time on is how to use the machine, because the problem for the US is that they have the world's greatest machine. No one has a better machine. China is getting closer regionally, but no one has a better machine and can move the machine anywhere on the globe and use the machine. The problem for Norway, we have a little tiny machine uh, who doesn't work very well, not, not jointly. Um, it's a really good thing to have a good machine, it uh, creates a bigger potential to, to, to win a war. But to actually do that, you need to move to the right-hand side of the slide. What is war? How to win it? I think um, since I've been studying air power for some time, I think the, real, the last really serious air power debate was uh, 25 years ago. Mentioned on the screen on the bottom right corner. After that, it was, it's been developing different kind of concepts, which is a totally different thing. Military theory is about what is war and how to win it. Uh, but the concepts, how to use military, how to refine the machine, because that is what we've been doing. These concepts is not military theory. They are concepts refining the machine. And that's a good thing. We need to refine the machine. We need a really strong, powerful machine. That's a good thing. But we spend far long, we should balance that with understanding more how to use it properly. Um, because the culture within a Norwegian Defense Force for sure, and I would be really surprised if that's not the case in Finland, Sweden, and Denmark, is to gravitate towards the tactical level. It's, it's not our culture to gravitate up to huge strategic long term thinking. No, no, no. It's the opposite. For the Air Force, it's surely the, uh, the case. The more technology, the, the smaller, the, the how to fly, how to, uh, the more energy. Thinking about that stuff, that's just the uh, geeks at the Air Force Academy or other places. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit 
tabloid here, but the point still stands. Okay, uh, what I would suggest is uh, a little bit less fancy than multi-domain. It's the legal theory, which I used to play with when I was five or six or seven years old. Um, because the future is uncertain. We don't know what's gonna happen. Maybe it's gonna happen in the high north. Maybe we have one operational theater in the north, one in the southeast, maybe not. We don't know if, come, if the enemy comes through cyberspace or whatever we want. So being flexible, understanding how to, understanding the nature of the war, understanding difficulty, the uniqueness of what's gonna happen. So what we do need is to be really, really clever at building Legos. And what do the Lego pieces constitute? Well, um, each of parts can be technology. So F-35s or Jet 39 Griffin, or it might be transport or whatever. It's also different concepts and theories, the way to approach war, okay? Um, so the name of the game is to have the different pieces, and when this situation arises, we build together the unique constellation to handle that particular situation. Not to build something big to do, to focus on one defined scenario. I don't think that's wise at all. Okay, so, um, Air Sea Battle and Military Domain for Norway, and I think for Nordic cooperation in the future would be less emphasis on multi-domain as the holy grail of military operations for the future, but rather take the interesting pieces of air-sea battle, the interesting pieces of multi-domain, enter into the big box in the middle of various pieces, and try to learn how to piece them together, try to develop the Magnus Carlsen chess kind of strategies to do that. Because we are really struggling. We are struggling even the most basic of joint operations. We have, for the time being, three long-range shooters, or we are short of getting the joint strike missile. Okay, so we can um, um, the naval strike missile for the uh, corvettes and frigates, and we're gonna have joint strike missile for the F-35, and surely in an air-sea battle, air-sea coordination, we need a military patrol aircraft. Okay, so do they seamlessly operate together? Not at all. So at the Air Force Academy Air Power Seminar uh, two months ago, and we had one of the most experienced uh, Corvette guys and one of the most experienced F-35 pilots standing up and says, well, we really, really need to improve. So even the most basic Lego building we are struggling with, yeah? And in terms of multi-domain and uh, each other's domain, could I, could I give you one short anecdote on education in Norway? Okay, so uh, for the past few years, I've had the, um, the how to say that? The specialized uh, five or six weeks education on the staff college for those who wanted to deepen their knowledge in air power. And I asked the staff college, uh, wouldn't it be a good idea if my class studying air power could contain some people from the Air Force, uh, no, some from, 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 the, from the Army, some from the Navy, maybe? on the cyber, and they said, uh, sorry, that's uh, slightly too difficult. Uh, it's only Air Force officers. Are you sure about that? Yeah, pretty sure. It's not gonna be them. Copy. So six weeks with a bunch of people who want to study that, Air Force officers. Okay, so in the end of uh, those six weeks, I was offered a chance to have one day with the Army students and one day with the Navy students. And they got one day with the, uh, with the Naval instruction and so forth. We called it the Air Power for Dummies. And I had them for one day, and I started that day, to, and I asked uh, the class of, of, um, uh, from the Army, and I started to ask the, the guys from the Navy as well, have you ever studied air power before? And most of them said, no, sorry. I've been a little bit involved, I had a, a couple of lectures back 20 years ago, but I have no substantial understanding for air power. Okay, copy. Do you think it's a slightly late to have that one day with me when you're 40 years old? Yeah. A little bit late. Yeah. Do you think one day is a little bit small? Should we try to elaborate a little bit more to understand each other's domains? Yeah. But, but, but that time they started laughing, yeah. Um, so um, if you're gonna start talking about multi-domain, we could start with 
I mean, I, I'm, I'm joking about this. I mean, the, the, it's so low hanging fruit, it's, it's a safety hazard. You can stumble on it and, and hurt yourself. To just make basic education to understand each other's domains, that would be something to start with. Not the fancy slides, just to have a basic, reasonable education that gives you a, a, a minimum of understanding of the other domains. Yeah? Okay. Um, we could discuss that afterwards too. If, if I'm looking at what happens in Ukraine now, the, the most astonishing thing is how the lack of genuinely new military things happening is the opposite. Almost everything happening in Ukraine is something that we have studied before. So we end up in a uh, none of the none of the parties. Uh, has achieved air superiority. It's an artillery fight. There's the way they are operating is in, in a sense unique, but there's nothing happening there that is really, really totally blew out of our mind. We didn't think that's going to happen. It's, it's just a lot of the old Le Lego pieces who is built together and operating in, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about multi domain and fancy slides and everything, we should um, have two thoughts in our heads at the same time. So we need to go back to basics. Before we talk about multi-domain, we need to have long-range uh, ground-based air defense. We need to have that in order to protect ourselves. Now, I think the chief of the Air Force uh, started uh, well, a few months, maybe a year, maybe one year and a half, started to how to disperse our aircraft and so forth. Well, we did used to think about that quite a lot. Um, now. Um, from Rusi, who's been really an interesting think tank during the Ukrainian war. Uh, one of the last publications was the Regenerative Warfighting Credibility for European NATO Air Forces. I think that's one of the themes of that report. We should go back to some of the really, really basic that we just chose, opted not to think of for many years, but that we used to think about. Okay? So we need to just fundamental stuff that we need to incorporate. So that, that's one thing we need to think about. And then that doesn't preclude in any way, shape or form, the way of thinking forward. But that's been a development all the time. It, it, we're not going to uh, integrate cyber and space now. We've been doing it, but, but there's going to be new ways of doing that. Artificial in, uh, intelligence, there's, there's going to be a whole charade of things that we need to incorporate. Yeah? So, but, but the balance, balance is really important. Okay. So this is a really, really good idea. Please ask me something about later. Uh, later. Um, on the air side, okay. Maybe uh, we should have these exercises to sh show that we can use the flexibility and the speed of air power to regularly gather 20, 40, 80 aircraft together with an integrated system, not only fighter aircraft, but uh, patrol aircraft and transport and so forth, to show that we can do this on a regular basis. So, to sum it up, um, I think we can just ease up a little bit about uh, the term multi-domain that that's going to change our lives. Um, I think it's important. I think uh, Norway and the Nordic nations should speak multi domain kind of language, uh, talking to the Americans, but I think it's better to understand multi-domain and take all the things that's really important to our particular context and show that we really have understood what multi-domain are in our strategic context and, and our surroundings. Um, so we need to be better building Lego instead. We need to develop really clever people who can play chess. Uh, which I think is uh, more important than the main operations. This is my favorite picture. I do not believe that increased Nordic cooperation is going to generate sleepless nights in the Kremlin. I think they're going to meet Norway and other NATO nations, slightly trying to hide that you are tired. What kind of meeting am I in, really? Um, but they are going to recognize the increase of combat power. It's not going to scare them. Thank you.
Thank you very much for that presentation, Doug. So you said, uh, well, not once, but at least twice, that you wanted a question about the AOC. So um, here you will have one from the Norwegian AOC, uh, Colonel Adam Petersen. Do you consider a Nordic joint headquarters a precondition for establishing a Nordic AOC? And if not, how do you suggest the unity of command and or effort can be achieved? Or in other words, which entity should be the higher echelon of the Nordic AOC? There are many big questions, but I suppose you grapple with whichever one you like. Yeah, please, could you just uh, take the beginning once more? Do you consider a Nordic joint headquarters a precondition for establishing a Nordic AOC? No, I don't. Uh, really, I don't. Um, it might be a good thing, it might be a good idea, um, but I don't think it's a precondition. I think uh, it's possible to find command and control solutions to that, um, even uh, if you haven't a, a joint HQ. Um, I think it's more important right now that we are not being conservative or um, I think for many years the, the, the political left in Norway, um, I'm not sure if that goes uh, within the other Nordic nations, has been speaking about Nordic cooperation as an alternative to NATO, which is, uh, in military terms, never was, not an alternative to it. Um, now um, we can have that in the framework of NATO, uh, aligning both the perspectives, um, and to um, just do this. Um, because. Um, and General Deason touched upon this because uh, some people have said that, um, well, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a difference in strategic outlook from the various NATO nations, no, various Nordic nations. Okay, so Finland has, has, has a close eye uh, on their border to Russia, um, uh, which, uh, which, um, which is logical. Um, Sweden focus in the southeast, Kaliningrad, the Baltics, Gotland, and so forth. Um, Norway uh, um, tends to focus um, up high north. Is that a problem? Is that something that is uh, really difficult to handle? No, not at all. I mean, uh, if we are going to uh, cooperate, we need to take really seriously the strategic concern of each nation. Um, and they are what they are. Uh, so what then becomes important is um, to meet together, um, preferably have some sort of common education, if it should be the staff college, as General Deason mentioned, or uh, another aspect. But at some point, we should really learn and understand each other's strategic outlook. Uh, bringing that into the um, AOC uh, and sitting around the table, uh, planning for exercises, talk together, understand each other, uh, build, build competence of each other's uh, way of doing things. Um, procedures, language, personal relations, just in terms of competence. I mean, the Norwegian um, uh, NAOC, National Air Operation Center, uh, the people who are working there are, are clever people. It's not that big. It really isn't. If you do this, 250 fighter aircraft, a number of uh, other types of aircraft, helicopters, um, uh, surveillance control, uh, GBAD, and so forth. Um, just to, if you have a rotating, um, well, structure there, uh, big in charge, uh, we will build competence on a different level as well. So just in terms of building competence, this is a really, really interesting aspect of it. Um, so I think the nature of air power, uh, reach, altitude, speed, um, this would be, have, a, have, a, have a potential because, and, and interestingly enough, I don't think, uh, well, uh, I haven't met many Air Force officers, at least in the Norwegian Air Force, who are reluctant or think this is a stupid idea. Or, not, On the contrary, I think the Norwegian Air Force, almost everyone I've been speaking to, think this is a good idea. It's not something they need to sell. Um, it just makes sense. Huh? Uh, thank you. I have another question from Sweden, Christer Andreen from the Royal Swedish Academy of War Sciences. Um, he actually uh, sent it and directed it partially at the General Deason and partially at uh, at you. So we will see if we can get some find some extra time afterwards to uh, give some extra questions, uh, General, if that's fine with you after the next few presentations. Uh, nonetheless, how do you envision the relative defensive and offensive roles of Nordic air power? Yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, in my mind. Um, 
I don't think we need to change the posture. Uh, in my mind, uh, what we should signal uh, is a um, basic defensive posture with a capability of hitting hard offensively if we should choose to do so. Uh, we have no intention of doing that at all, but uh, everyone knows that with that kind of number of uh, 15 generation fighter aircraft, you have the flexibility to use the aircraft the way you want. So none of us has any intention of attacking Russia. Russia is pretty, they, they know that. They're they not afraid that we're going to enter. But, but if they start poking not one nation as they used to, used to do, now they are poking at the entire Nordic Defense Corporation, all the nations together. Um, um, we should have a defensive posture, um, but making them aware that we have an offensive potential, whatever that means. We're not going to attack Russia at all. Um, but in my mind, this, it would be slightly business as usual. We're not going to change posture in Denmark or in Finland or in Sweden or in Norway. We're going to continue as now. But, but the, the combat power is, well, has increased many times. All right, uh, with that uh, notion uh, of perhaps eternal wisdom, that flexibility is the key to air power and a lot of other success in life as, as well, I think we will move on. Thanks a lot, a big hand for Doug. One of the advantages of uh, being uh, a moderator and uh, sort of trying to arrange the whole seminar is that you have pretty much complete control. Uh, one of the downsides is that it puts you in the awkward position where you kind of have to give your own introduction, so I'll try to do that now. My apologies. But as mentioned earlier, I am an uh, air battle manager by trade. I have served in, served in southern Norway, northern Norway, and uh, abroad. Uh, most recently in uh, NATO at uh, Combined Air Operation Center Udem from, 2000 and, from 2018 to 2022. After I returned, I went to the uh, newly established Air Warfare Center at uh, Rigge. And, uh, and also, I've, after that, I've, I just had a little touch and go, then I went over to the Ministry of Defense recently, uh, but it is not in that ca capacity that I'm here. I'm uh, speaking here because of the work that I'm doing for the, for the Air Force, but the views are my own because of the role that I have. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to give you a status on what happened on the Nordic Air Corporation uh, throughout the last year, year and, year and a half, in the broad terms. Uh, tell you what the status is uh, right now from uh, my perspective. Offer a few words on the Nordic Air Commander's intent that has attracted a lot of attention across the globe. Um, and talk a little bit about the opportunities that we see now in, in, in the way ahead. So, starting with... Uh, Sorry, starting with uh, with the background, a little bit of, of my background as well, because I believe you need to understand where I'm coming from to understand my perspectives properly. So serving in Keok Udem, um, I supported uh, two tasks, two main tasks that that headquarters has. One is to conduct air power operations north of the Alps in Europe, and the other task is to be part of the joint force air component whenever that is set up to do any, anything at, at all. And that background is very useful when we have, uh, when, we, uh, when we reach the date of 24 February 2022, in the words of FDR, a date that will live in infamy, but much more recently and certainly has changed the strategic environment for all of us sitting, sitting here. Um, so for, for me, that meant that coming from the NATO command structure JFAC, it uh, made me think with the Swedish and Finnish applications to join the NATO, this seems like a pretty good idea, like Doug mentioned in the previous presentation. And how could we do that? We also have a fairly forward-leaning chief of Air Force in Norway. So during the summer last year, he publicly announced 
the Nordic AOC. That's something that we should strive to uh, strive to get. And uh, that basic idea uh, got a lot of endorsement, both from the NATO side, from the national side, and the Nordefco in the military strategic and political <coughs> environment. And it led to the establishment of a Nordic AOC working group to look at different options for uh, scalable establishment of a Nordic Air Operations Center in some capacity. Um, the cooperation between the Nordic nations goes back much further, uh, much longer than that. We have had very good cooperation between uh, all the Nordic countries and especially the trilateral, trilateral air cooperation between Norway, Finland and Sweden for quite some time. So the initiative to establish a working group to work more closely together goes back to 2021 when the Nordic Air Chiefs got together and said that we will have a working group to figure out how we can cooperate better uh, than we already do. And that led to a first working group meeting in Reitan in June. Uh, during that meeting, it was decided that we need to get Denmark on board in this working group as, as well, and they outlined some of the current status of the strengths and weaknesses that we, that we had, which led to another Air Operations Center working group meeting in Uppsala, Sweden, in September, where Denmark was involved. That was followed up later in December, a uh, meeting in Tikakoski in, uh, in Finland, uh, before we uh, arranged the fourth uh, AOC working group meeting, which is actually taking place as we speak, because all of the members are here in uh, this room, and we're working together, uh, and we are including Iceland to complete the five nations of the of the Nordic Nordic community. So that is something that is ongoing, and also uh, to uh, uh, reap the benefits of having this seminar at the same time. Um, the current meeting that, we're do, uh, that we are holding is very much influenced uh, by the Nordic Air Commander's intent, and I will get a little bit back to that uh, afterwards. So the current status from my perspective, uh, or in other words, what have we achieved with this working group uh, on the direction from the Nordic Air Chiefs over the, over the last uh, year-ish or so, is that we are continuously building trust between the Nordic air community, exploiting one of our strengths between the Nordic nations. We are enabling a common understanding. We are working out our differences and strategic outlooks and pushing forward uh, to, uh, together. We are trying to create and utilize an extensive network, which is quite challenging. It is both a strength and a challenge that there are a lot of fantastic initiatives out there. Uh, I believe General, General Deason mentioned the Nordefco as an astounding uh, failure uh, in terms of maybe not getting everything done, but it's certainly been useful that we have a lot of very, very good political and military strategic venues to, to agree and make, uh, and, um, make things materialize. Uh, so we're trying to uh, get a good overview of that and uh, to use the momentum that currently exists to push forward. These efforts support both the political and military strategic uh, guidance that we have received. It supports Nordefco in general, it supports NATO overall, so it's certainly not a competition to, to NATO as such. We have chosen an open-ended incremental approach it means that we develop as much as we can together without uh, committing ourselves to something that we don't really have backing for, and it gives us that flexibility that we need. There are also numerous challenges in the multi-domain world, or if you want to call it multi-domain, uh, non-kinetic operations, joint all-domain operations, or all the other buzzwords that uh, Doug uh, just uh, told us about. It doesn't really matter that much. But the fact of the matter is that the world is evolving and we need to be able to be flexible and to adapt to that um, development. Um, what we have uh, come up with, uh, quite concrete, is that we have uh, established three possible steps of enabling a Nordic AOC. Uh, and one way of portraying it is that uh, it's like I've done on this slide where we have sort of a step zero on 
uh, where we are uh, cooperating, uh, we are deconflicting as of now, but uh, with uh, three possible steps that includes uh, establishing something called a digital AOC, where you can imagine a uh, fully networked and fully interoperable uh, structure, but with uh, no physical exchange of personnel. Uh, it's possible to imagine a second step, which is uh, which we've now called a semi-distributed air operation center, where you have a core of uh, multinational personnel located at one one place, one way or the other. And the third step is a physical air operation center uh, established at some point with a defined mission and so on, a true multinational headquarters. And the last thing is, of course, what uh, Doug was talking about, which he is, uh, thought was a good idea. And it's one of those ideas where you hear about it, you think immediately, that is a really, really, really good idea. And uh, that, was, that was my gut feeling as well, when, uh, when we first had the Finnish and Swedish um, NATO applications come, come up. Because uh, size really, really matters. It, um, uh, individually, our four nations are medium to small nations, but together there is quite a significant amount of resources and land mass to keep hold of. Additionally, there's been a very strong political mandate, and in the words of General Deason, we, uh, we really have to cooperate. So this can be, uh, this is something that is feasible from uh, my perspective, but it's not something that will be, uh, that will be easy. Um, but you can also uh, raise the question, why do we need a Nordic AOC to be able to come up with, to do air operations in the, uh, in the Nordic, uh, Nordic region? Uh, we also have numerous different uh, air headquarters around there. Why can't just the existing NCS KOKUDEM do it? Why can't just the, NC the NATO command structure JFAC do it? And I've outlined that in one of my uh, I've been writing a little bit about that, but just to sum up is that the uh, current uh, combined air operation center UDEM is really not structured to do that uh, what, whatsoever and also has a huge amount of different nationalities, which is a little bit challenging. And that uh, challenge with the abundance of nationalities and frequent rotations to make sure that you never have your personnel in one place at, uh, for, a, for a very long time is uh, further compound, compounded in the NATO command structure JFAC whenever that is stood up, which generally is rarely and they have limited training opportunities and by its very nature it's supposed to operate anywhere in the world at, at any theater and that gives very, very limited insight in the exact resources, special conditions that is required in the Nordic area. Uh, so while the NATO command structure, uh, JFAC or CFAC, or whatever we would like to call it, because we like to change the names a lot, uh, is called, uh, it is clear that this is a formidable capacity for air power, but it is not ready quickly and it is not trained for our specific geographic challenges. Uh, so these, these play into why NATO cannot do it from a day zero readiness perspective. Um, and that is uh, something that is, uh, that is a challenge that we, uh, and, uh, and also an opportunity that we can exploit if we play our cards right and we have the political backing to do so. Um, furthermore, there, uh, within the NATO construct, the deputy commander air role, uh, when that was invented a few years ago, it seems like it's almost tailor-made for this type of, um, of air operation center, where NATO uses the regional air operation center to, uh, uh, to supplement and be part of the NATO command structure if, if the conditions uh, suggest so. And that could... Uh, could mean that we would achieve a sort of day zero readiness where the, uh, where the organization is as um, similar as possible during peacetime crisis and conflict. Because as we know, what you do every day, you become, you generally excel at what we do now and then. You maybe you will become, become sort of half competent and what you do very rarely, you're not really very good at. And that's something that we can achieve. So my question, and it is a genuine question because I believe there is a chance to 
uh, reach a pretty good capability without a physical air operation center, but are we truly able to uh, to conduct seamless operation in the Nordic area without a common physical air operation center? I have, at least from a personal opinion, uh, I have my severe doubts that it can be done, but we can get pretty far without it. So, a few words on the Nordic Air Commander's intent. The case for the AOC has been known for some time, uh, but what has uh, uh, been attracting a lot of attention recently is the Nordic Air Commander's intent. It was uh, signed 16th of uh, March, about, uh, about a month ago, and uh, the four Nordic um, Air Forces, they went out publicly and uh, stated that they are committing to continuing their already well-established cooperation. So together with uh, General Hecker, come here, come down in Rammstein, they signed the intent, which solidified their cooperation and it uh, supposed to pave the way for further strengthening the Northern Air Forces with the aim of ultimately operating as a single Air Force. This is no small feature and it's uh, what we like to call a big, hairy goal also was explicit in terms that we would utilize the Nordic exercises such as Nordic response to uh, uh, as a milestone to measure progress to uh, and uh, moving into the future further strengthening the transatlantic bonds and continue the existing momentum the wind of opportunity that we have, have right now uh, to prepare for the conduct of multi-domain operations and in the long term decide on viable long-term solutions. One way of uh, visualizing this uh, puzzle board, uh, you can see on the left hand side. So with the Nordic Air Commander's intent, the plan is to come up with a common Nordic air concept, uh, which is built on four lines of effort, which are integrated air command and control, ops planning and execution, flexible and resilient air basing, which we will hear more about in uh, from uh, Brigadier General Anders Persson shares air situational awareness and common air education training and exercises, which is, of course, quite extensive. Um, and to develop this concept derived from the intent, there will be a tailored Nordic development group uh, that has already been established. It maintains the open-ended incremental approach that has been established in the Air Operations Center Working Group, and we continue to uh, move along in that direction in close coordination with the military strategic level, the political level, NATO, and the other interested parties. The concept itself is expected to have uh, to be out at least within the Air Forces within the next six months months and it will be based on NATO framework and methodology. That brings me over to the last part of my presentation before opening for questions. Um, in this picture uh, provided by NASA, um, it, uh, it shows a, it's a pretty, pretty nice picture and with the different arrows I try to outline different directions this work might take from from my perspective. We, have, we are certainly having a very good cooperation within the Nordic community itself, uh, but the attention attracted from the rest of the world is pretty significant. Uh, when you look at this area from a NATO perspective, from Keokudum, this is all considered one big area that is changing now. The Baltic countries, the Baltic CRCs um, and older units in that area will have a huge interest in this. Europe itself, with the Joint Force Command Brunsum, will pull this effort sort of to, towards Europe. And the other Arctic nations, including the United States, Canada, Great Britain, will have interest in influencing and being part of this one way or the other. Where we are heading, it's not known to me or anyone else at the moment. But what is clear is that we have an abundance of opportunities and different direction that this work will take. I truly believe that our open-ended incremental approach will provide us the flexibility that we need to safeguard our countries uh, in the future. It will be very interesting to be part of that journey. And speaking from the camaraderie, cooperation, friendship established within the working group and everyone else who are part of this, uh, I 
feel fairly optimistic for the future. I was uh, intentionally trying to keep my presentation short so I wouldn't bust my own schedule, which uh, luckily leaves uh, room for some questions if you have them. And then I need to open my phone. Sorry, <laughs> that's a moderator issues. So far, this looks fantastic. It was just so crystal clear that no doubt in anyone's mind. Feel free to write questions for later. And if you agree, we can move on to, uh, to the next presentation. All right. Um, so with that out of the way, uh, it is our fourth uh, time for our fourth and final presentation before we go over to lunch. Uh, Brigadier General Anders Persson started his career in the army, surprisingly, before he, uh, he you became wiser and you became fighter pilot in the Air Force where you flew uh, Wigan. Uh, recently, you became the deputy vice chancellor or vice president, I'm not sure which title is correct, perhaps both in, at the Swedish Defense University, even though you did say that you were from the Air Force, so I believe that that's where your heart really lies. Um, you have a numerous... Um, in, the, in the armed forces in the joint headquarters, led transformation in the Air Force from 2017 to 2019 to, um, to form the new Air Force staff. Um, and something that I found interesting and very impressive is that you have, in fact, in fact a combat proven ability to cope with modern technology as you demonstrated last night when you overcame the severe, uh, severely horrible hotel Wi-Fi and were able to send over all your slides. Uh, sir, welcome, and the floor is yours. I guess an interruption on the communications. Let's see if we can do something about that. So, perfect. So now it's only me who's standing in front of the lunch. So we'll keep it short, of course. I have the great honor to, to represent both the Academy of War Science and the Swedish Defense University and the Swedish Air Force. Even though I belong to two different academies, I try to have an academic freedom time two today. So a lot of the extreme options are my personal, and you have to figure out which. So thank you for the possibility to speak in front of you. And now that all pilots have used their Night vision goggles, and I have never used them, but DVGs, day vision goggles are quite as good. So I'll talk about a flexible and resilient Nordic air base concept, and it's, it's mainly built on the article we wrote together, three friends. It was Robin Hegblom, a Finnish defense blogger, where he writes on the name of Corporal Frisk. If you haven't studied that bl uh, blogger, I certainly encourage you to do that. And of course, this was retired Colonel Perry Exoli from Norway, senior advisor at Nord University and defense analyst at Snoopy. So I'm going to present what we really already written and some personal opinions about that. Why is it important to have a resilient uh, airbase concept in the Nordic? Well, we heard it already from, from the start of the general, the importance of to integrate our forces. For example, this is from the beginning uh, Swedish Air Force slide, but I think it's a symbolize a strong Nordic Air Force. So, of course, we need to have a balanced Air Force systems of systems, etc. The larger bubbles is that we need to enforce the possibility to do tactics both in the air and on the ground. We are not certain on the quantity, how, how big quantity does the enemy have, but in the Nordic Air Force, we already talked about, we have about 250 fighter, modern fighter aircraft in the future, and that's more than equal the numbers of Russian aircraft in the same region. So the, 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 the quantity bubble could be bigger, really, when we talk about the combined joint air force. But to be able to handle this, we need to be tactical superior in the air domain, of course. And I think with those fighters that we're going to acquire, and maybe a Nordic Joint Force Air Components uh, Command and a Nordic Air Operations Center, we will be tactical superior in the air domain but not the least, we need to also not remember, forget 
the tactical superior on the ground, as we have seen in the, in the war in Ukraine. The importance of moving around the aircraft all the time and have intelligence saying when attacks are happening and then move the aircraft immediately. Otherwise, they will be attacked on the ground. And we have to make dispersion, we have to be agile, deception, and high tempo, and qualified protection on certain air bases, I will argue, and of course, a high and dynamic readiness in the all air forces we're going to use. This is the reason why we need this, this uh, agile base concept. We need to win the fight to get airborne and before we are attacked. We have had different air base concepts in all other different countries, and, and with the option that I might be wrong, so please correct me for, for, for the other Nordic Air Forces, but this is my view of them. This is a beautiful J-29 fighter aircraft from the winter in the 1950s, so it's a Swedish one. Uh, Norway, big air bases, NATO, but dispersed before uh, in the Cold War. Hardened shelters, Finland has always had a dispersed basing concept since the Second World War. The Sweden have had different air base systems, called the Airway System 60 during the 60s, which changed to the 90s, and there were all, all dispersed options. Denmark, big air bases, hard and shelters, etc. What is the future? I will come back to that. But of course, the Nordic countries need to be more flexible and resilient. NATO, and not the least US, are also talking about some more flexible and resilient options called the air combat uh, employment or the US Marine Corps agile concept for air bases. And we have talked about this, but this, this is more or less where we all came from. We had a good concept, I would say, during the Cold War in all our Nordic countries. And then we started to reduce, and we got less and less money. And we had what we call in Sweden the strategic timeout, when we thought that peace will be forever in the Nordic part of the world, and we only needed to go to foreign countries somewhere else and, and make peace there and then would be enter peace everywhere. We realized it in Sweden at the first in 2008 with, with the Russian aggression in Georgia, but still not enough money. It was not until, if I'm honest, 2014 it started to change and the defense decision in Sweden in 2015. Then we changed the curve to get more money and then we have been on that track since then. So also in the Air Force, of course, we have changed a lot. Just for an example, I take Sweden. To the left, you can see the concept during the Cold War, a lot of air bases, every circle represent one air base battalion with an air base group who were in charge of. We had uh, during 1980s and early 70s, more or less 100 possible runways in Sweden to use for, for, for the Air Force but we also had 450 fighters then, so you needed a lot of runways to use. Today, we have more or less five air race groups. Uh, this is not a classified picture, so, so you can't find the correct runways to use, so to say, but it's the concept. And directly, you can see that there is something missing in the middle, if you look at that way. But then if we move to, from Sweden to a Nordic air base, this is not the classified picture, it's all the civilian air bases from, from possible for helicopters, propeller aircraft, etc., etc. So it's not possible to land with fighters on all those. But we have 186 possible runways in the Nordic countries. And some military war bases in Sweden are not on the map, so you can add those to those 186 possible air bases, which means that the asphalt concrete is not the problem. In some areas it is, but mainly not. So we have a lot of possible runways to use, which they have done in Ukraine. They used all possible runways whatsoever. And that is the way to put it. So if you could go back to the, to the picture that they used, the system that we used to have in Sweden, and you apply it in a Nordic perspective, in an integrated way. You skip the borders between countries because in in the sky, there is no borders. So in the same way, in, when you talk about air-based concepts, you shouldn't you, limit yourself to talk about the difference between Sweden, Norway, Finland, Iceland, or Denmark. We need to focus in an integrated way, as the general reason already mentioned. So maybe 
this is the air base groups that we should focus on. Of course, I would be tough for the one who gets the one in the middle with the Baltic Sea in between, so hard to go around with the fuel tracks from Sweden to Norway to Finland. But just look at it and think about the possibilities you can have when you look at this. So the Finnish Air Force can be stationed in Finland and, and Sweden. The Danish F-35s can be in Denmark or in Sweden or wherever. This is the only for, for air base battalion groups that you could be able to handle all the different aircrafts from all the different Nordic countries. And I apologize that I didn't put any circle on Iceland. There could be one or two in Iceland, of course. And what kind of different base concepts do you have in, in the different countries then? We, we write about it in the articles. I will just briefly go through it, and with the exception that my, something might be wrong. Apologize for that. Norway is more or less a static air basis today. But inside the airbase, my view is that you can have dispersed aircraft and you have a lot of shelters, etc., on your airbases. You're looking for one or two F 35 bases, or maybe more. And the GBAT system, you have both in the Army and in the Air Force. And in the Air Force, you have NASAMs to protect your airbases. But not us, let us not forget other aircraft that could be possible to, to discuss different airbase concepts for the P-8, the C-130, and also all the helicopters. When we move to Denmark, more or less the same system. Shelters, airbases, but dispersible inside the big airbases. You have to talk about one or two F-35 locations, in my view. The g -Bad, as far as I know, correct me please, from Denmark, is in the Army. And, and you have also specific aircraft that you could discuss, C-130, Juliets, and, uh, and helicopters, of course. You talk about Finland. The base concept, as I mentioned earlier, of course, the dispersed concept. You can see it on the F-18 who lands on the normal road. You talk about four to six F-35 bases, plus all the different road bases you have. And as I understood, you look a lot of the U.S. Marine Corps Agile concept for their F-35s in the future. The GBAD is in the Army. You have kept all the different layers that we used to have also in the other Nordic countries with anti-aircraft artillery, Stinger mat pads, the RBS system, 70 self-propelled and manned portable versions. You have a missile system called Trotal, self-propelled, and also have the NASAMS too. Air defense. You have all the layers. The only thing you, that you really don't have is a medium range or long range uh, GBAT system. Yes? Uh, Certainly. Uh, uh, ah, super. So then you have a truly uh, shell system, uh, uh, onion system, really. So it goes from short range to, to, to longer range. That's perfect. You have Hawks, you have uh, transport aircraft, you have Lariats, you have helicopters. How should we take care of them in a Nordic view? And Sweden, we have a dispersed concept yet, even though we have reduced a lot from the, from the Cold War. At least 90% of all the air base capability have been reduced and taken away. We talk more or less about eight full bases today, plus road bases, possibilities. The GBAD are in the Army, we have no GBAT system in the Air Force, uh, for example, the CV-90 anti-air artillery is for, for the brigades. We're going to buy man pads. We don't have them today, but we're going to acquire them. Makes me terrified as a pilot, but uh, usually, the, 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 of course, we need to fix the system so, so everybody knows what is happening in the air. We have the RB-98 Iris T system infrared and of course the newly acquired RB-103 Patriot system. But we only have two battalions. So we have to pick two places in Sweden that we're going to protect against uh, missiles and ballistic missiles. So guess where they're going to be? Probably around Stockholm and somewhere else. So, so, so that's a really strategic decision made by the, by the Joint Force Commander, where he going to put the Patriot systems. Uh, when we decided to buy 60 Gripen aircraft, 60 or 80 new Gripen Eco versions, we said that if you're going to pick 60, you have to buy at least six or eight 
battalions of patriots to compensate for that. But the politicians chose 60 and one battalion of patriots, which they divided in two battalions. So that's why we have 60 uh, and not more than 60 new uh, Gripen Echo aircraft and, and only two battalions of Patriot slash Iris T. We also had a missile system called the RB-97 Hawk system. So it's still present, but we also sent some of those to Ukraine just a couple of weeks ago. So that's why it's not on the, on the, the slide. We have also old C-130 hotel, airborne early warning aircraft, global eye aircraft in the future, Black Hawks, NH-90 so far in the Swedish armed forces, even though the armed forces have suggested to the government that we should stop using the NH-90 and go for more Black Hawks helicopter and something else. I couldn't help myself, even though we don't have that aircraft anymore. It's still there. It's the Viggen aircraft, I mean, on a dispersed basing somewhere in the two th early 2000s. For, I think most of you already know it, but for, for those who haven't seen it before, and it's some slides of how it looks when you land on ordinary roads. The upper two ones are from Finland. It's a Gripen landing on a Finnish airbase, uh, ordinary uh, airway uh, road in Finland to the left, and the two F-18s taking off on a, on a road in Finland. But it's not only fighter aircraft that are possible to use it. Of course, our trainer has done it. Uh, this uh, is an example just to show that it is a normal road uh, during ordinary days. This is a picture from last year's Air Force exercise when we closed down the normal uh, way outside in, on the western part of Sweden and for 10 minutes landed a Hercules, pushed it to the side, opened the road, closed the road again and took off with the Hercules and inside the Hercules was the king. So we flew him back from the western part of Sweden to to Stockholm in, in that. It was a huge success, of course, because everybody likes to watch aircraft. There was people everywhere along the roads, and no one was complaining that we closed down it for 10, 15 minutes every time. But all the aircraft on this slide are possible to use dispersed basing. But we also have aircraft that I think we will not be able to handle. And these are, for example, these two. I don't think that the P-8 can land on the road somewhere, and I'm certain that the new Global Eye aircraft definitely can't do that because it's a sensitive aircraft, both of these aircraft. And both of these aircraft collects a lot of data, and you need to take care of the data when you land in some way. So you need to have specific air bases that are possible to use. And, and for, from the Swedish view, it would be perfect the Global Eye aircraft, for example, could land somewhere else than more to the west, because it's probably outside of the Caliber cruise missile or, or the Iskander missile. And what about the rest of the different transport aircraft we have with a special purpose, the SIGINT aircraft that also need to be taking care of the data when they land? Can we fix that on any specific uh, airbase? No, I don't think so. So we need to have more than only focus on dispersed air basing only. Then we have all the different kinds of helicopters. We have Seahawks in Denmark and uh, what have I understood in, in the future in Norway, and maybe some other close neighbor to Denmark and Norway We decide for Seahawks also. Who knows? I don't belong to the Air Force, so I don't know. But as a, as a outside from the Swedish Air Force, I would, I would deeply recommend the Swedish Armed Forces to, to, to buy Seahawks in the future and, and connect with Norway and, and Denmark to, to, to look at common training, etc., etc. And Black Hawks, maybe some other Nordic nations will look at that one also. You have the same helicopter uh, for, for sea rescue, Denmark and Norway. NH-90, Finland, Sweden and someone else had it, or still have it, but you don't fly it, and etc., the Bell 412. We have a lot of things that we need to focus on how to handle from an air basing concept. Maybe we need a concept to be able to have Seahawks put together in the northern part of Norway. All the Nordic efforts in the Seahawk community could, could need to have an air base to hunt Russian submarines north of Norway. 
or in the Baltic Sea, for example. Because, as the Americans call it, logistics under attack, you need to have a concept for that. And, and I think that the, the old Swedish system is one way to do it. Uh, that is what we call the base 90 concept. It's the, the runway hotel. The main runway is a full runway, and the Bravo Charlie and Delta is shorter runways, about one kilometers. So you need to have some kind of fighter who can be able to land on about one kilometers of runway. And you can do that, of course, with the big end because we could reverse the engine. And with the grip, and it's so, so much smaller than the big end, so you can also use that system to, with, with good brakes and skilled pilots, of course. So what is the future, really? The future of the Nordic Air Base concept, in, in, in my view, is to go back to use all possible runways because we can't afford to have really, really qualified GBAT system on every Air Force base in Nordic countries. On one hand, you can, you can argue that during the Cold War, NATO had a concept of the so-called Hawk Belt you, through Germany, on you know, the western part of Germany, and up to, through, through Belgium and, and, and the Netherlands, I think. So you can, we can, in some way, build uh, uh, some kind of belt that went through, should go through the northern part of, of Norway, up in the north, and then through Sweden, Finland, the Baltics, Poland, etc. In some kind of what you're building in the other parts of Europe, it's an Aegis ground-based system, together with, with the cruisers, with the Aegis capability. But if we, if we can't afford that, because they are ridiculously expensive, you have to choose another one. And the example is for, for, for the Swedish approach, and I think that's also the Finnish approach, is to use all possible runways. Focus more on dispersibility and less on ground protection, because it was more or less than almost 100,000 people during the Cold War that was engaged in all the different air base battalions in Sweden, and that's way too much people. We, can't, we will not have that many in the future. Maybe you can even be grateful and say that you only need Main 10, 15 maintenance squads or platoons that always are on the run <laughs> or on the move in each areas. Moving from runway to runway, they're on the station at the runway for six hours, eight hours, and then they move to the next. Because we have to look, use space, and know when the Russian satellites are passing by. And after that, we know we have uh, uh, not more than in the future, six hours, 12 hours or something before they can look at the picture and attack that airbase. So we need to move. The satellites pass by, move the aircraft all the time. So the aircraft are flying more, all the time or and the maintenance platoons are, are moving to the next uh, airbase. But then, of course, how to handle the specific ammunition because we can't have ammunition in every place. Well, then you can just, you're sitting in a fighter aircraft you fly to that airbase, refuel and rearm, and you go do your mission, and you land on the other airbase to collect that sort of ammunition. So you need to have a complete command and control system that really knows where are the ammunition, on which airbase, which aircraft to land where, and to have a, a truly Nordic air operation center then. So that's, that's, a, that's a prerequisite. From the base operation side, you should have used UAVs, of course. So before you go, you, 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 you drive to the airfield that you're going to use, you send in the UAV and, and you do a recce of your own uh, airbase system for an hour or two hours before you go there, so you know it's safe. Then you go in, take down a two-ship or a four-ship formation, take care of that, send it away, move to the next one. Where even a, 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 a suggestion that we should install masts already done, uh, standing on every runway in Sweden, and then the UAV could land on the mast, stay there, get good connected with the electricity, etc. what you need to load it up, so to say, and then you could use the sensors on a static way, and then you can fly it from that point. Really innovative things that, that one of the researchers at the Academy found out. We need more GBAT system, of course. In Sweden, we don't have any protection on the air bases at the moment. 
but we need to focus them on the high value air assets, as I mentioned earlier, the P8s, the global eyes, specific air bases that we need to focus on, on heavy maintenance. What about the main operating base for special purpose aircraft, for the SIGINT aircraft? It's only not needed to have a road base, but you need to something to collect all the data. And I think all the, all the, you who have chosen the F-35, you know the enormous amount of data each sort you will have and how we will take care of that if you're going to land on a road base. That's something for, for, for you to figure out. Transport aircraft, helicopter-based concepts. Maybe we should have divide more like this, west, center, and east. So the repair and heavy maintenance need to be done in the west and also the uh, high-value air assets should focus to be stationed in the west, so as far as, way as possible from, from the ranges of, of uh, the caliber cruise missile and, and in Skander uh, ballistic missiles. So you take off and then you do rearm or refueling before your mission or after your mission, then you can go back to, to the west to be more safe. And maybe as the Academy of, of War Sciences have suggested in Sweden that we need to focus or try to get uh, F-35 capable airbase in Sweden also so to, to make it easier for Norway and, and Denmark in from the south part of their country to, to move in and refuel and rearm in Sweden also when we need to protect Finnish airspace or Baltic airspace. But we need to start now because uh, I've been involved in Nordic Defense Corporation and, 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 uh, for many, many, many years. And I remember the first time we talked about it, we said, well, we're going to handle this exchange of air picture, recognized air picture. It takes it the most three, four years. And that was eight years ago that we should be clear. And we have some exchange with Norway, but we have not yet fixed it with Denmark or with Iceland or with Finland even though it's on the way. And probably NATO, of course, concept will help us do it. But don't focus on the problems. You need to start doing it. So as an American said, think big. And I added, but start small. And the truth, I borrowed this from, from our researcher, uh, Victoria Fedorshak, a Ukrainian, who, who is now at the moment studying or, or research at the university, Swedish Defense University. The answer of the extremely dispersed versus uh, well-defended air bases for, for, for the Nordic country might be in the middle. And as this German guy said many years ago, combine the extremes and you will have the true centers. And I think we ha we'll need to have both. Both some heavy fortified defended air bases to the west and a dispersed basing concepts, the more closer to the enemy you get. And that ends my briefing. Any question, add-ons, or corrections from my fellow colleagues from different countries? Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Brigadier General, for uh, that lecture. Uh, you included uh, more uh, aircraft pictures than anyone else. You went down to the low tactical level and. As uh, Professor Hendrickson will argue, that's where we like to be in our light blue uniforms at the very low tactical levels. Um, uh, we'll start off with one question from, uh, from myself. Uh, from your perspective, what are the main obstacles for achieving this resilient and flexible air basing concept that you have very well outlined? You need to do it and stop talking about it and making PowerPoint presentations. So, so we need to really do it and start, uh, start, start uh, doing it in, in, in the small way, as I argued from Think Big. This is the, with the fully integrated Air Force, Nordic Air Forces is the big picture, but we need to focus on the small steps forward because otherwise it will be, as, as the professor said, multi-domain slides and not true true issue to really focus on, on, on the move forward. And of course, to be able to handle all this dispersed basing, you need a truly combined air operations center. All right. 
Thank you very much. Uh, so, unless there are any uh, afterburner questions coming in right now, just want to uh, wrap up the first uh, wave uh, that we've uh, we've been through. So we started off with the big military strategic perspective, <laughs> and of course a big hand. Thank you. The audience is clearly much more clever than uh, than I am, so it, it's very good to, good to see. So wrapping up the the first wave uh, and the different sessions that we've been through, we started up uh, very high and uh, historic and military strategic perspective on. Uh, Nordic military cooperation, and, uh, air, and he highlighted, of course, that air is the domain where we have the biggest opportunities to get a, get a lot done. It can certainly not done, be done exclusively by land forces. Then we went over to a conceptual framework uh, underlining multi-domain operations um, from uh, Professor Doug Henriksen. Then I gave you an update on the current status and some thoughts on opportunities in the multi-domain world and where the Nordic Air Commanders would like us to go before we rounded off with the flexible and resilient Nordic Air Base concept, underlining that we need to go from making these beautiful PowerPoint slides to actually doing something, which I think is a very, very nice well to round off before lunch. Um, we have 40 minutes uh, until we are supposed to be back again at 12.30, and then we will go into space. So unless there are any comments from the front row, Chairman, AFA, no? All right, have, enjoy your lunch, and please be back at 12.30. Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats for the second wave. So for our fifth, uh, sorry, sixth uh, briefing today, we will get uh, retired Vice Admiral uh, Rick Breckenridge, who's a career submariner and retired from US Navy in 2017 after a 35 year long career. He asked me to keep this introduction short, so, so I will. <laughs> But uh, very glad you are with us to offer some perspectives from the other side of the pond, from both from an American industry and technological perspective. So here he is, um, Sector Vice President Strategy and Business Development. That is a mouthful. And with that, here you go, sir. Very good. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished uh, guests. Uh, Chairman Leon, thank you very much to you and the Air Force Association for inviting me to uh, join you today. Uh, it truly is an honor, uh, and yet it is a, a bit of a humbling um, experience. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I think it's good for every conference to bring in an outsider, somebody with a different perspective uh, that doesn't know the ways, the norms, the biases, uh, the traditions, and I'm certainly that. So 
you know, as mentioned, a U.S. U.S. Uh, participant in the conference, an outsider. Um, you know, a submariner. Uh, my domain is a little more viscous uh, than than yours, and uh, and yet some of the rules uh, apply. And then uh, and then from industry. So I, I did retire from the, the Navy five years ago. I've been working at Northrop Grumman in the United States, and I've learned a lot about the partnership between uh, industry and defense, and and uh, how how we stand strong. You know, as we work together, both from a warfighting perspective and an industry perspective. I'd also like to give a shout out to Svein Holton. Svein, where are you? I need to be able to make eye contact because he's my ultimate, uh, he, he was a good friend who uh, led me uh, here to, uh, to join you today and uh, really appreciate uh, your friendship, leadership and this opportunity. Let's see, I did, I did uh, quickly write down some notes. So uh, as I tried to learn your tribe, I was scribbling away throughout the day and uh, and what I'm going to try to do is give you what we say in the United States Navy submarine force, a repeat back for correction. So I'm going to, I'm going to share with you what I've heard from you and you have the opportunity to say, no, no, that's not what we said at all. You know, you, you just don't understand. Uh, so please uh, prepare your questions and push back for anything that I might uh, introduce today. Uh, <clears throat> a couple other quick opening remarks, uh, you know, wanted to uh, give a shout out to Finland. Uh, for their uh, team joining into NATO, a big, big step. Uh, you know, I, I've really, you know, I've always admired Norway for its longstanding NATO membership. It's great to see Finland join uh, the team and, and Sweden uh, to shortly follow. And uh, we look forward to uh, that, that big moment. You know, part of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, why partners? You know, uh, why, why do we need these types of agreements? Uh, wh what does it really matter in the end? <clears throat> And, uh, you know, uh, again, without getting too uh, patriotic, I'll just tell you that it matters a lot. And, uh, you know, the rules-based international order that we have all benefited for our entire lives, everyone in this room, um, is a very, very precious thing. It, and it's not just about the U.S. or Europe or the Nordic. It's about those of us that practice and, and, and uphold um, freedom, um, and the ability for sovereign uh, nations to, to rule for the people and by the people. And when we have uh, authoritarian regimes that uh, push back and challenge against that, it's incumbent upon us to uh, stand up and unite and, and have resolve and, and, and pull everything out of the toolbox because the stakes are high and it really matters. And generations to come will judge us for this moment in time. And I know, uh, as was mentioned earlier, that we always you know, seem to live in the, in the craziest uh, time in world history uh, as every year goes by. But I will mention that I do think this time is different. I think the challenges are similar, but I think there's a lot at stake. And so it's important for us uh, to stand together. We, the United States, need you. And I'll, I'll, I'll come to that a little bit uh, in, in my background, my personal background. Much of what I've done in my adult life uh, rested on the shoulders of close friends and partners like Norway. Um, particularly with regard to safeguarding and protecting the high north. So we, 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 we need to stand together, and let's not forget that. You know, uh, one, one, one question was asked, a good one, you know, what the heck would the Nordic countries care about war with the, between the U.S. and China if it, were, if it were declared? Well, let me just say this. If China, an authoritarian regime, decides to go ahead and, cre and, and, and disrupt the rules-based international order in the Pacific, and the United States goes to war, for all of our key allies that are close to that furnace to go ahead and stand up and stand by them to protect them. If we were to request assistance from the Nordic nations in that fight, my prayer and dream is that you would, that, without hesitation, respond. You know, again, if you, you, you think it's on the other side of the world. We're going to talk about the Arctic in a second, how close China is uh, to the Nordic and why eyes on the high north are going to really matter uh, as we go forward. All right, enough of that. So my team put this slide together. I don't know where they got these pictures, but uh, let me just start off by saying uh, what's really important for you to know is I'm a lobsterman's son from uh, Cape Cod Bay in Massachusetts, a blue collar kid without much chance of uh, going to college, let alone becoming an admiral in the Navy. And let me just tell you, there's a lot of different kinds of fishing out there, but the coarsest, basest, dumbest, knuckle dragon form of fishing is lobster fishing. You know, basically, you're, you're throwing these lobster pots out in six-pot trawls on the bottom of the ocean that you cannot see, hoping to catch something that may not be there, 
and, and with, with smelly bait that uh, your hands reek for months and months afterwards. So with that, with that upbringing, you know, th there's some analogies here, back to rules, rule-based international order. There's a rule-based international order in how you do lobster fishing. And when that order is disrupted, bad things happen. So let me give you some examples. Number one is, you know, there's a buoy, a, a line, trap, 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 six traps, another, another line. That's a six-pot trawl. One of the rules, rule-based international order, in the high seas of Cape Cod Bay is you can't lay your trawl over a, a fellow lobsterman's trawl. And if, if you made the mistake and do it, and he's pulling his trawl up, and, and as a result has to drag your trawl up, the rule is you get to cut the line, and you can either release the line and let it go, and so now that guy has a disjointed uh, trawl, or you can tie it together and, 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 and set it back in the bottom of the sea. And you can, you know, uh, we, we, all, we all check. It's, it's sort of like the flags on the table here. Every lobster buoy is marked by the owner of that, of, of that business. My dad fished 300 lobster pots. And so you, you, you quickly look to see whose line might have crossed your line as you're pulling it up. And your, your behavior may change based on uh, whether it's a friend that, that made an honest mistake or whether it's someone who's still trying to learn the ways of the sea and, uh, and, and still coming to terms with how to, um, oh, you know what I did? I gotta get this, this is my timer. So I stopped, uh, stopped telling so many sea stories. But um, there's rules of civil conduct that must be respected and safeguarded. And so, uh, so when we talk about the high north, um, I've been there. And so, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the other quick sea stories I'll share with you is uh, the Navy has some pretty crazy traditions. And, and again, the Air Force clearly may not appreciate or understand them, let alone your regular uh, civilian populace. But one of our traditions is when you cross the equator, we have a ceremony where you become initiated into, into becoming a shellback, tough, crusty, trusted shellback. You're a, you're a slimy polywog before you've crossed the equator for the first time. After the initiation, you become a, a shellback. And, uh, you know, uh, King Neptune, had, you know, there's a court, King Neptune presides over the court. There's an initiation ceremony that uh, is classified, or I, I would give you more uh, details on that. But, um, but then you become, you become a shellback. Well, it's important for this group to know that uh, when you cross the Arctic Circle, heading north, we have another ceremony. It's called the Blue Nose Ceremony. And there's a king of the high north, Rex Borealis. And, uh, and he presides over that court. And so as you cross the Arctic Circle, before you, before you get, get a blue nose, you, you go through an initiation, top secret, not, not at liberty to discuss the details. But uh, I've, I've had the uh, pleasure and privilege of, uh, of becoming a blue nose uh, a number of times as, as I've journeyed into the high north. And so, and, and I guess this, this, this picture is a good, uh, a good example of the unique challenges presented up here. You know, it's, uh, well, let me start with the, the adversary up on the top. You know, it's, uh, uh, you know, th this is Russia's front yard, right? And for them to get to Europe and to the United States, they got to go through your yard. And so it's really important uh, for us to work together. And as I mentioned, uh, I've, done, I've done a number of missions in the high north, and that's really high north. Um, I've, I've operated north of Svalbard. I've operated north of uh, St. Joseph Line. Um, I'm not going to talk about Navaya Zemla. But I will say this, last night at 1 a.m. in the morning, as it would, due to jet lag, I'm, I'm looking at my news feed. There was an article in my news feed, it almost knew that I was going to be speaking today, about Russia expanding air bases in Navaya Zemla and St. Joseph Line uh, to be able to service bombers, long-range bombers, out of, out, of, out of those two protected bastion havens. Why does that matter for this group? Well, because part of the resolve of, of, of this Nordic agreement is, is awareness in the high north. Not only the undersea threat that I spent my, my manhood um, you know, per perfecting the art of, but other nefarious activities that are going to happen in the air domain. And so we need to see, detect, and to deter bad behavior from an adversary like Russia because, uh, because that's, it, it's spreading north. Um, a, a sort of, sort of, certainly a threat to the northern flank of NATO, but as, as I mentioned, there's this new domain opening up uh, in the Arctic that's got, that is also going to be a highly contested environment. And again, you know, uh, 
Crazy times uh, result in, in driving partners together. Look at AUKUS um, between the UK, Australia, and the US against the China threat. I do view the threat to the Arctic, both by China and Russia, will we'll, we'll bond with resolve Canada, United States, and uh, the Nordic countries, uh, because that is our area that we need to defend and, and again, preserve rule-based international order. You know, it's a tough place. You know, I've, I've had opportunity to pull into Hawkinsvern and to Tromso, and, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, you, you, gotta, you gotta be tough. You, even Liberty, uh, it, depending on the time of year you're operating up here, can be uh, quite, quite an adventure. And so, you, you know, you all are a rugged people. You live in a harsh environment. You've endured, uh, you know, tough challenges. And I think that's, what, that's important. If, if I'm gonna go to a fight, I'm gonna want uh, Nordic countries uh, alongside, or, or if I'm gonna support you in your fight, uh, I, I know I'm coming in with a tough, uh, tough um, partner. You know, uh, it's a good spread. I mean, you look at the map, and, and again, you know, we could, I don't know, put, put the state of Texas up there for perspective, but you know, this is a, this is a broad area. There's a lot of challenge as we go all the way over to Iceland, Greenland, and, um, and beyond uh, into, the, into the high north, uh, up to the Arctic uh, ice pack. And uh, so how do you manage that? How do you do air domain warfare adequately given the stressors uh, that are posed by the environment? <clears throat> you know, uh, I, I talked about the Russia threat. You know, for me, it's pretty simple. Um, to deter bad behavior, you need to be able to see the enemy. You need to be able to blind the enemy from seeing you. You need to be able to kill the enemy. There was a question about offense and defense earlier. You know, uh, the best defense is a strong offense, I guess is the flip of the, the football term analogy, right? Is it, if I don't have a strong offense, bad behavior will ensue. And so I have to go ahead and, and gird up and be ready to um, you know, uh, show the adversary that, that that move is not worth taking. See the enemy, blind the enemy, kill the enemy. And to do that, we need to concentrate effects, not necessarily forces, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then, and then through all, you know, decision superiority is key. Who can see, have the awareness, actionable, as, as mentioned by the last speaker, intelligence, whether that's from space or the aerial air, who can fuse that together in the fastest way to make decisions that deter bad behavior? Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited about this. Here you go, you got a submariner here briefing, you know, this, this uh, Nordic Air Commander's intent letter. And, uh, you know, it resonates with my soul. Um, it, 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 these principles are great principles. The idea of how do we how do we integrate things all the way down to training and and trust me I know that's one of the hardest challenges uh, that the trust factor not just between man and machine but between partners and how, how do we go ahead and, and, and fuse that trust through um, appropriate uh, training I'm, I, I talked about shared situational awareness uh, you know we've had a couple slides today um, from space and as as mentioned by one of one or two of the speakers. You don't see boundaries from space, right? They, they sort of vanish. You see, you see an AOR, you see an, a region, an area. And how, how best do we go ahead and protect and defend that uh, with, with, with a common set of values? All right, I haven't seen these bills. That was pretty cool. Let me kind of back that up. I want to see that again. Uh-oh, there we go. And then, awesome, okay. <clears throat> uh, well, the air, air domain is vitally important. And, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of myths, particularly over on our side of the pond in the United States, that, hey, pretty soon, you know, space is going to be ubiquitous with all of its ability to do everything, and so we're really not going to need an air domain. So why would I invest in more, you know, air power? Uh, I'm here to tell you that you need both. It's a yes and. It's not an either or. You need both for, for a number of different reasons. But the air, air domain, uh, for, to have, whether it's air superiority for a time, whether it's uh, a denial of uh, the adversary to be able to have that air superiority, th those, those truths, those military warfare principles are enduring and need to be uh, protected. So the values, and some of these were already briefed by other speakers, but this idea of uh, defense in depth, 
um, you know, the, the idea of strength in numbers. There's, 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 a, there's a value with that. There's also a liability with that. And we'll talk about that challenge on the next slide. Um, you know, uh, this slide says concentrate mass. I, I really want to help bust that phrase, military phrase. I want to concentrate effects. Okay, and sometimes that's going to be fires, sometimes that's going to be cyber effects, sometimes that's going to be jamming disruption effects, but I want to combine or mass effects, not forces. And so, so again, the principles that I see within this agreement are all about distributed forces that, that concentrate effects to disrupt the adversary. And I think that's a truly important principle. Well, you know, uh, you know, I worked in the Pentagon, a number of those tours. They didn't really highlight those as much on that slide, but I, I can do two types of warfare, aside from lobster fishing, I can always fall back on. And one is, is, is killing bad guys from the undersea realm. The second is battling the budget in the halls of the Pentagon with, with the Congress of the United States of America. Both types of war fighting are hard, require really tricky uh, skills, but uh, there's always going to be fiscal pressures. And so one of the values of this concept is how do we go ahead and uh, unify our efforts so we don't have to duplicate them? I don't want to continue to have to buy my kit and have my neighbor next door buy the same kit if, I, if there's a way we can combine uh, forces and effects and, and do that in a more synergistic way. Um, and then you know, the last thing I'll mention is, is it, there is a strong deterrence factor here. AUKUS uh, uh, with China, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you as a guy who used to work at Naval Reactors that produces uh, nuclear-powered submarines and aircraft carriers in the United States, I know how long it's going to take Australia to get their own indigenous nuclear submarine. Most of us will not be on this earth when this happens. But, but why was AUKUS important? Because it showed that two strong um, powers united together to go ahead and push back against a, a, a bad um, leader and, and uh, system. Um, that, that sent a tremor uh, in, 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 in uh, Westpac. But I, I think in a similar situation, this agreement sends a, a clear and unambiguous signal to, to Putin and his cronies that, hey, it, you know, if, if you're going to mess with Finland, you're going you're gonna to mess with Sweden, you're going to mess with Denmark, you're going to mess with with Norway, you're going to mess with Iceland, you're going to mess with the United States. So, so think carefully uh, before you, you take that swing, because the consequences, there, there, there is the strength in numbers aspect. Strength in numbers, efficiencies. Um, I'll talk, my last assignment uh, in the Navy in, in the U.S. was at Fleet Forces Command in Norfolk, Virginia, mainly pushing carrier strike groups out, out, out around the world. But we, we did try to, uh, you know, redefine air-sea battle, uh, as mentioned earlier. And, and we, we developed this concept we called uh, distributed maritime operations, DMO. The idea of how do I take, rather than concentrate my fleet to go do an effect, like a carrier strike group, how do I have a distributed fleet uh, that's harder for the adversary? It spreads red. It makes red's challenge much harder. How do I make that work? How do I make distributed maritime operations work? How do I knit that together? How do I make sure it's, it's efficient? Um, I think that's the challenge that's uh, inherent uh, within this, this agreement. Uh, part of that is uh, the second part of uh, the, this concept and approach was what we call the, uh, the fleet tactical grid. So this is net-centric warfare. It's how do I take fourth and fifth gen things that don't talk to uh, each other very well and have a Rosetta Stone gateway that can go ahead and translate and push information to the shooters, to the, to the uh, sensors, and to the payloads themselves, net-enabled net weapons. That's going to be really important for the future. Very, very relevant in the air domain. You know, one of the things uh, that was spoken about earlier was this idea of being able to take off from an airfield in Norway and land an airfield in Finland, and, 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 and again, the air commander sort of uh, controls those assets. Uh, he, he is not, he's agnostic to whether, what flag it wears. It's just what capability it has and how is it going to be employed for the effect that we want uh, at, at a given time and place. You know, we're looking at that really hard in the U.S. right now as, as, as we, we look harder at uncrewed uh, systems in, uh, for air domain warfare. So collaborative combat aircraft, CCA is the abbreviation over in the U.S., 
right now we're making agreements between the Navy and the Air Force that whatever this thing is going to be, this payload truck that, that, that will operate in the vicinity of other uh, crewed fighters, will be able to take off from land, land on an aircraft carrier, take off from an aircraft carrier, land on land, and, and again, the air commander has uh, control and use of that asset. So it's distributed, but unified with regard to its employment. All right, another good build. Well, with every great uh, strategy, there's, there's usually an Achilles heel. And, uh, and, and I think the idea for those of us that have served in the military, you know, you have to um, be witting soberly about uh, the Achilles heels of an agreement, uh, a bold, big, hairy, audacious goal, BHAG, um, that, that's resident within this agreement. So there are some areas that RED can exploit, right? I mean, you know, again, I, I know NATO and I, and I know Russia. And, and there are times I envy Russia, that they can move at, at, at a much up-tempo speed as compared to NATO, where, we, where we, we're based on consensus. There's, there's a certain tax you, you have to pay with regard to that. The, the adversary uh, can exploit that uh, for sure. So, you know, there, there are tensions, um, you know, among nations when priorities diverge. I mean, this is reality. So how do, you, how do you overcome that? What are the rules set? What's the rule-based order that is going to go ahead and referee between those types of things so that we can continue to not get splintered but have a, a unified approach as we go forward? Um, so I'm going to present a couple of big ideas. I'm not going to read down this slide, but these are from my notes uh, listening to you all uh, earlier today. One is this idea of connectedness and uh, the challenges, and, and again, uh, from one of the earlier uh, briefs, you know, we've been talking about net-centric warfare for a long time. We haven't really done much about it. And so, you know, what are the steps that we need to, to take to get there? I like the idea of think big, start small. You know, is let's, let's just go pick something where we're gonna knit a few things together, whether it's for a demo, a, an exercise, or to, to showcase a, a warfighting result that is not only multi-domain, but is multinational and then ultimately multi-security multi enclave. And let me just mention to you that that's another challenge that we have uh, between partners, is what, what types of exquisite, super secret squirrel info am I willing to go ahead and share uh, and, and with who? And how do we begin to uh, smooth out that division between levels of classification with regard to how we know what we know? I think there's some technological ways that can do that. So connectiveness, think big, start small. You know, in the United States right now, we're, we're looking at two kill chains. Uh, we at Northrop Grumman working with the military, we're trying to close two kill chains. One is the long range counter air kill chain. Is I want to hold, in the case of China, J500s, which is sort of their AWACS equivalent. I want to be able to hold that at risk. How do I do it? What, what do I need from space to the seabed floor? What payloads, what, what shooters? How, how do I knit together a JADC2, Joint All Domain Command Control System, that can go ahead and close that kill chain and, and demonstrate that we can do it? Multi, multinational, multi-domain, as mentioned. The other kill chain is counter-maritime. And again, uh, we're, we're, there's no air-land battle that we're looking at with China. Let me just be clear on that. And, and I, I'll even say that for the record. Um, but the maritime is going to be, uh, I think, where the, ne the next fight occurs if one entails uh, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, Westpac. And so how do we, how do we close that kill chain, uh, the counter-maritime kill chain? What, what types of technologies, again, with a distributed force, uh, have, have massed effects or concentrated effects? How do I close that kill chain? Um, <clears throat> Converging effects at the speed of relevance was, was an earlier quote. I love it. Converging effects at the speed of relevance. Well, that's, that's thought-provoking, right? What, how fast do you think that might be? What is, what is the speed of relevance uh, today as compared to 15 years ago? What is the speed of relevance going to be 15 years from now? And uh, so I, I do think that machine speed will become the speed of relevance and how we set up the right rule-based order for that, of uh, the man-machine partnership, and, and, um, and, and again, the, uh, to be able to operate at that right speed. What we're going to need to be able to operate at it, 
you can't avoid it. It's, it's going to happen. So how do we go ahead and, and set up that, the rule set to, uh, to, to be actionable at, the, at machine speed? Artificial intelligence machine learning will be certainly important. Uh, next big idea I want to talk to you about is new domains. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've spent a lot of my adult life focused on the below water and above water and the boundary between those two. And, and what happens down here and what happens up here and, and how do I get across that boundary? It's hard. It's hard with communications. It's hard with uh, time, timeliness, with, with commander's action. Um, and, and I'll tell you that the new boundary layer that I'm more intrigued by now is, is that one between space and air. And, uh, and how, do I, how do I get the things I know in space and get, the, get it not from land to land to air, but how do I get it from space to air to perhaps not enabled weapon to effect? And, and how do I begin to bring that into much sharper focus um, you know, as, as, as we move forward? I think that that's a domain interstitial boundary that we're going to need to start to focus on more together um, within our alliance. You know, I've, I've talked about the Arctic, um, you, and you all appreciate this much more than we do. But I, I really view this, this Arctic challenge as really, really ramping up. We've talked about it for 10, 15, maybe 20 years, but it's, it's becoming palpable, real, where action needs to be taken to, to uh, have the right uh, deterrence, value, uh, superiority within the Arctic. And, and again, we need to partner very closely with you as we look at uh, that domain. And then maybe the last big idea I'd share with you is Technology can be really helpful to stitch together things that are already in our kit in ways, different ways. It, it can take old things that we already have and, and, and utilize them in a new way, uh, not yet conceived, or, or a different type of asymmetric power uh, when we use technology to stitch those together. So again, there, there's a lot of value to the concept. There are a lot of challenges to the concept. We have to go in eyes, eyes wide open. You know, and make sure that we're, we're mindful of these seams and not to get tripped up on, with them as we go. Well, you asked me here as a private sector, uh, industrial base, uh, Northrop Grumman strategist, and uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm still more of a lobsterman's son and a submariner than I am that. But what I will tell you is I've been amazed as I've worked closely now at Northrop Grumman with some of the tools that are in the kit uh, that can go ahead and stitch this together. Gateways and in, in the... Uh, high aerial um, long endurance layer, whether that's uh, a uh, uncrewed Triton, whether that's other assets that can be that interlocutor that's stitching together fourth and fifth gen comms and, 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 and uh, ha having a greater uh, push of information to uh, relevant sources at the right time. Um, we have a, um, a battle management command and control system at Northrop Grumman that right now is um, being brought to life in Poland that's going to have a big effect over that part of, of NATO. What does it do? Well, it, it goes ahead and brings together systems, radars, uh, uh, land-based, platform-based, air-based, and stitches that together into a C2 powerful kind of way to be able to utilize uh, those uh, existing forces, different countries, knitted together uh, in this integrated battle command and control system. Um, maybe, maybe my last big idea for you before I drop the mic here is, uh, there was Bill Owens, submarine uh, friend of mine, uh, Revolution Military Affairs author. You know, uh, that, that term has always intrigued me. What is the revolution in military affairs or the next one? Well, one of the things that I'd like to leave you is maybe perhaps a thought-provoking thing is, uh, particularly in the maritime, being able to hold continuous target track custody of anything we want that's on the surface of the ocean uh, is upon us. You know, before we used to, there was an over the horizon challenge. You could sort of stay over here and operate over here and you couldn't be seen or radars couldn't see you, space couldn't see you. You know, you had this, this distance uh, element for how you operate. We are at a, we are at a point in human history where between space and aerial assets, uh, any Chinese warship that goes to sea, we will be able to maintain continuous target track custody. How does that change the game? You know, it, 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 it can prevent, present a deterrent factor that the adversary has to put into their calculation. True here in the high north. Uh, whether it's in the Arctic, as that region's being exploited, whether it's coming through the Barents, Norwegian Sea, and through the GIUK gap, 
being able to have eyes on and have that continuous target track custody is going to be important. You, you will be a key contributor on that. You have been a key, key contributor on that. Most of what I, the cool things I have medals for in my old job is, is, is a result of you uh, tipping me and pointing me in the right direction uh, to go ahead and, and do uh, my sport. Um, I think it's appropriate, it's also true in the air domain. You know, how, how do we keep a watchful eye on Navaya Zimla, on St. Joseph? How, 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 do, how do we have that persistent stare uh, with, with, again, some of the, the challenges we have in space uh, going forward? How, how far over time am I? Five minutes, okay. Um, well, the last thing, there's, there was a little mention of digital transformation earlier today. I will tell you that digital engineering is, is much more mature now that I've been on the industry side uh, to see it. So the, the B-21 bomber that we just had the rollout of from Northrop in uh, December, it wasn't born digital, but it be, we've been able to, to make it a digital platform. Um, so every aspect of it, um, the, the design, the production, the maintenance, the testing, uh, digital engineering is at the heart of making that system, uh, a, system a, a, a system of systems uh, going forward. And so I think, a, that will also be a key enabler as we try to fuse uh, things together here across uh, Nordic countries. I, I didn't talk about the lawyers uh, because that's always a bad way to end a speech, but lawfare is a hard challenge. Let me, let me give you one last quick C story. I don't know I'm over time. You're, you're being gracious over here. You know, uh, one of the last things I did on active duty was um, a close collaboration with the United Kingdom. Is th there are two new carriers, and we can, we can debate about whether or not the UK needed carriers, um, but uh, Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales were, were in construction and about to be delivered. Uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth about to be delivered. There was a realization that uh, the, the, the Brits were not going to have enough F-35s to employ on Queen Elizabeth. So uh, they, they formed, you know, an agreement between the U.S. and the U.K. to go figure this out. And so I spent two years of my adult life trying to work through politics, lawyers, rules of engagement, of how to employ a, a U.S. Marine Corps F-35B squadron on board Queen Elizabeth for her maiden deployment. That's a big challenge. It, technology wasn't the challenge. It was, it was a lot of these other gnarly things that, that uh, we, we have built up walls uh, between us for probably good reasons at the time that are just no longer helpful uh, with regard to partnership and how we get things done. So in conclusion, oh, 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 there you go. I think I've covered these points. Let me see if I did. I think I got number one, and uh, number two is self-evident. Yeah, 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 so I don't want to, I, I really don't want to come across as the arrogant US guy in the room. And I, I hope you see this as genuine. I rely on you. I've, I've relied on you and your partnership for military effectiveness throughout my adult life. I can't do it without you. And, uh, and so as, as I fly across over here to Oslo to, to have this talk with you. Once again, is it, it's it's not uh, you know the US, I forget what that quote was. You know, US can do everything they want to do unless they can't, and then they need everyone else. I, I don't know what the exact quote was, but we need you, and it's genuine, it's real, and we we need to go shoulder to shoulder in this challenge as we go forward. You've got a good kit, um, you've got resolve, you've got a good construct. And now we got to go do the hard work of making it real, and and using technology as we can. And uh, subject to questions, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have. Doctor, Master Maestro, over to you. Thank you very much. So thank you a lot for... <laughs> Thanks a lot for the presentation. And you really did provide an outside perspective. And uh, personally, I really appreciated that you highlighted the challenges, but also outlined some potential solutions for us. Uh, we will save any questions that might come in for later, but please do send them in if you have, or in the breaks, just come see me and I can write it to write it down for you. Uh, but once again, thanks a lot, a big hand. You are in luck because the next point in our program is a uh, coffee break. So now you can go ahead and grab some more coffee and please be seated like back again in about 13 minutes. Hopefully that should just suffice.
Ladies and gentlemen, please slowly find your seats. Please uh, find your seats and we will get going in the third session in the second wave. We have now been through six presentations uh, to paint a picture um, and with the backdrop of that picture we will now go into national perspectives from Norway, Sweden and Finland before we head into a panel debate which primarily will revolve around their perspectives but we also have the opportunity to raise questions to some of the former uh, presenters, uh, if time permits. Um, so with that, uh, start, so we will start off with the first of the three short presentations. Uh, the first presenter um, stands on my right-hand side. Um, she has a very esteemed career and has had so, well, basically, I guess, your entire professional life. Uh, one of the first things was being the top cadet uh, from 1994 at the Air Force Academy, and that bode very well for your future career. You have served in many positions in the Air Force and the Ministry of, uh, of Defense, and I guess you are most famous for being the chief of the Norwegian Air Force, both as the first female and the first non-pilot to ever do so. Uh, when we were looking at someone to present the Norwegian perspective in the seminar. You were at the very, very top of our list, and I'm very glad to say that we were able to get you. So here today, representing Ministry of Defense, uh, Major General Tony Shinaran. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that introduction really <laughs> raised the bar of expectations. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure uh, and thank you for the invite to take part uh, in this uh, seminar. Uh, thank you to all the previous speakers for very uh, good uh, and interesting insights uh, and perspectives and, and not at least updates on uh, the status and the possibilities for the way ahead. Let me start off by congratulating our Finnish colleagues on, uh, on the NATO membership as the 31st member of NATO. And we look very much forward, of course, to welcoming Sweden very soon. Uh, I also want to commend the um, Air Force Association of Norway, uh, the Royal Swedish Academy of War Sciences, Sciences and the Norwegian Defense Associating Association for organizing this uh, seminar in such a professional way. And also for facilitating a public debate through articles and issues, uh, and not at least when it comes to the topic of the day, Nordic cooperation, the last, or the last issue of 22 from, uh, from the Air Force Association, uh, focusing on Nordic um, cooperation. Uh, I read the, the issue uh, again as a preparation for this day, and, and uh, it provides a lot of insights and is very, very highly recommended. Um, my background uh, uh, was introduced, but I will also stress that I'm, uh, I'm here in the capacity of being actually a, a sort of a special advisor in the MOD for the time being. And I have also served as the uh, military committee representatives in, uh, in the Nordefco cooperation. Uh, so I want to zoom out a little bit uh, and uh, share some perspective, mainly from the policy level when it comes to Nordic cooperations, the opportunities that lays ahead. Uh, when asked to provide national perspectives, uh, we face, uh, in my uh, view, uh, the very positive challenge that uh, uh, when it comes to Nordic cooperation, uh, we are very uh, uh, in the same line and largely we talk about common perspectives rooted in all the good work that has been going on in the Nordic uh, and especially the Nordefco cooperation since 2009. Even though uh, 
General Deason previously uh, uh, addressed uh, NordEFCA as a failure when it comes to really getting together the big projects or common uh, acquisition. There has been a lot of progress over these years, and not at least that we have a common, com uh, a common view, aim, goal for the future. Um, the aims of Nordic cooperation is, is vested in a common Nordefco vision 2025, striving to go towards agreed targets in the ranging uh, broad specter of cooperative uh, areas. I will not touch upon all of them, uh, but uh, uh, selected, uh, uh, selected uh, uh, topics as I move forward. I will focus on uh, the Norwegian chairmanship's priorities when we had the chairmanship last year in 2022. And the main priority for Norway during our chairmanship uh, last year was to implement the Vision uh, 2025 targets with the aim to strengthening cooperate, operational, cooperation, operational cooperation in peace, crisis and conflict. Uh, I will also stress that the Norwegian uh, or the Nordefco vision and targets are supplemented by two trilateral agreements um, with focus on coordinating defense planning uh, in the northern part of the Scandinavian uh, peninsula between Norway, Sweden and Finland and in the straits in the southern part of the Scandinavian peninsula between Norway, Denmark and, Sw and Sweden. Uh, Hence, uh, focusing on what uh, General Deason said, we're talking about one Nordic region, but two operational directions. During our chairmanship, we put, it, we put particular emphasis on coordinating uh, of defense planning in the auspices of all these three frameworks, aiming to align our national defense plans uh, as far as viable, considering the fact that at that time two of us was within NATO and two of us was outside NATO. And not to mention Iceland as the fifth Nordic um, uh, participant. This priority really grew in importance and of course intensity uh, following the full-scale invasion of Ukraine uh, in February last year and the subsequent application from Sweden and Finland for NATO membership. Driven by the sense of urgency with the war in Europe and, of course, the, severely, the severe change in, uh, in the, um, the security policy situation for Europe and the world as such, and not at least the historic shift when it comes to the opportunities for even closer uh, Nordic uh, uh, security cooperation, there has been extensive cooperation in all levels during 2022 and onwards. Um, the Nordic CHODs have developed a common advice uh, to the policy level for how to develop holistic defense planning uh, of the Norwegian, Nor Nordic region within NATO. This is uh, uh, classified uh, documents, but the, the, the fact that, that they have gathered already for a common advice and a defense concept give proof to how much the cooperation has developed over the last year. Um, as future allies in NATO, we will be able to engage even deeper and more committed when it comes to the defense cooperation. And the at the political level, defense ministers have agreed on updating this vision I've talked about for 2025, um, aiming ahead when it comes to the purpose of NORDEFCO uh, in, in the, in, with the aim to, to facilitate and drive even deeper cooperation. But now, within the NATO framework. I will highlight some key Norwegian perspectives, uh, ranging from the strategic outlook, uh, reinforcements, regional defense plans, and C2 arrangements, before I touch briefly upon air and space domain, which is very well covered already by the previous speak speakers. Uh, it's a fact uh, alluded to several times uh, previous today that together the Nordic countries possess significant, modern and highly capable forces in all domains. Uh, through integrated planning, joint training and the ability to conduct operations seamlessly, the effectiveness of our combined forces and defense capabilities 
can and will be greatly enhanced. At the same time, which also uh, very well alluded to, the total Nordic region is a vast geographical uh, area, uh, not densely populated, um, and uh, the NATO border will in fact double with, the, with fin Finland as, uh, as a member of NATO. The Baltic Sea becomes NATO dominated, and the importance of the high North Arctic and the North Atlantic actually increases. We form one region with two operational directions. Uh, we have different strategic outlooks traditionally, um, which is also very well covered uh, by General Deason. And we have different traditions and cultures for defense planning and joint operations. However, joining different perspectives and building on each, other, each nation's strength provides great potential for gaining more together. Two plus two should sum up to be more than four. And obviously it's five, uh, <laughs> including Iceland as well, but it should sum up to more than six together. As the Vice Admiral has very well alluded to, um, the high north uh, and the Im importance of the North Atlantic uh, will remain uh, the strategic main outlook for Norway. We, we, we need to be uh, re focused against the north. And as a consequence of the uh, war in Ukraine and the attrition to the Russian conventional forces, the relative importance of the strategic nuclear capabilities at the Kola Peninsula, and hence also their concept for defending it, the bastion uh, defense concept, really being able to deploy this out in the international waters and the North Atlantic, uh, the, the relative importance will increase for the coming years. So uh, Norway will need to and will be still uh, focused on Russian, Russian capabilities in the north and the importance of having control in North Atlantic uh, in order to secure the sea lines of, of uh, operations. However, um, Norway's position as being NATO in the north alone will change. We need to change our strategic uh, thinking from being alone on the northern flank to what a whole new NATO northern region will mean for defense planning, capability development, training and exercise. Norway will also have to focus more on the dynamics in the Baltic Sea region and how we will contribute to the overall defense of the entire Norwegian region. So different strategic outlooks, uh, but uh, really joining this together uh, will uh, create great potential for strengthening our common and joint capabilities. Due to Norway's geostrategic po position, uh, we will have to play a key role for reception, uh, on, uh, reception staging and onward moving of, re of reinforcements, not only to Norway uh, in the years to follow, but also in transit to Sweden and uh, Finland across Norwegian territory. Uh, this will place stronger and more uh, requirements towards uh, the Norwegian capabilities of uh, these uh, receiving and sustaining uh, reinforcements, which will have huge implications, uh, and we need to dig into that for the coming years when it comes to uh, developing our common and coordinated defense uh, planning. Following the Finnish and sub subsequent Swedish accession in NATO, the regional defense plans uh, will be updated and the future C2 arrangements will be decided. From a Norwegian point of view, it's very important that these regional plans covering our region and the associated command and control arrangements are robust and formed, uh, founded in the NATO concept of deterrence and, and defense in the North Atlantic region. Secure has or will provide his advice 
on future regional plans and command structure, which will be processed and endorsed in the Military Con Committee and the North Atlantic Council the coming uh, months ahead of us. The Norwegian position is that the Joint Force Command Norfolk uh, will play a key role in the reinforcement to and defense of Norway. Hence, our position is to have a strong link to JFC Norfolk. From a Norwegian view perspective, it is also recommended that all the Nordic uh, countries fall under one JFC. So that alludes also to the uh, challenge on how to uh, face one region, two operational uh, directions, uh, and obviously also the link to the Baltic countries and North Europe as such. <clears throat> The possibilities of a combined Nordic regional joint headquarters affiliated to the eventually decided JFC for the region should be further investigated. And due to the nature of air power, um, a combined Nordic air AOC is a very viable option um, supplementing, but it should supplement the NATO air C2 structure. Uh, and hence the uh, very strong and offensive, uh, um, not in a negative way, a positive way, uh, Nordic airships intent is very welcome and, uh, and we look forward to see how that will progress uh, on the way forward. It's also important to stress that Norway emphasizes the transatlantic link uh, and, uh, in, and um, bilateral agreements, in particular with the US, uh, very well alluded to by the Vice Admiral again, uh, the importance of that uh, link uh, and the importance of, of uh, reinforcements and the North Atlantic sea lines of communications to make sure that we are able to defend Europe uh, as a whole. Uh, it's also important for us uh, to have strong bilateral links to UK and other European nations bilaterally or multilaterally, for instance, uh, in the framework uh, as the UK-led joint expeditionary force. So uh, a lot of work is going on as we speak, coordinating national Nordic defense plans. Uh, we look forward to and are strongly participants in the development of uh, the regional plans that will have to be expanded to cover the entire Norwegian Nordic uh, region. And uh, uh, the upcoming uh, Nordic response exercise in 2024 is a, a viable a arena uh, not only to include the other Nordic nations, but also to expand the exercise area and concepts uh, for the exercise in order to provide an arena for testing and developing uh, and coordinating the coordination of the plans and the reception of reinforcements to the entire region. So let me uh, dive into the air domain and the potential, which is very well covered, and I don't have uh, very much more to, to uh, to expand on, but I will uh, zoom out again. Um, it's very good to see that the close cooperation ongoing in all uh, the tactical level, at all domains in, at the tactical level, is well progressing. And there's a lot of meetings and working groups going on in all domains. But it has particularly matured in the air domain. That is, uh, that is uh, clear which is also very good and important uh, in, in the fact that uh, if we face a conflict uh, or be, uh, if we are militarily challenged in the Nor Nordic region, it will start with an air campaign, which also was alluded to earlier. As the previous air chief, uh, it's been very rewarding to cooperate with my fellow uh, colleagues. Um, and during my tenure um, from 16 to 21, we achieved considerable progress in uh, developing closer cooperation. The weekly cross-border training uh, events and the biannual uh, Arctic Challenge exercises has been a vehicle for development. 
and in particularly a uh, letter of intent that we signed uh, some years ago between Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark and USAFI to develop a step-by-step -step towards a flag-like exercise has really driven um, our capability to plan, coordinate and execute combined air operations. Uh, and that's what we build upon uh, when taking the initiatives uh, um, now further on. It was a priority for the Norwegian chairmanship in 2022 uh, in, to emphasize even closer cooperation and development uh, of air capabilities on the basis of what achievements already done when it comes to easy access across borders, agreements in place there, when it comes to agreements on using each, other each other's bases for alternate landing, also with armed aircraft, setting up a Nordic secure comms network, which obviously will be developed further as all, is, uh, uh, all the nations become uh, NATO allies. Um, the Nordic uh, Enhanced Cooperation on Air Surveillance, NORECAS, has taken years to form, but it's now operational. Uh, that's an achievement. And obviously the cross-border training and ACE exercises also. Hence, um, in the chairmanship, we put emphasis on Nordic Coordinated Air Command and Control Initiative called NORAC, with the ambition to move from cooperation to the ability to conduct combined air operations in Nordic airspace. And obviously, uh, the work on a common uh, AOC is one of the work strands under that initiative. When looking at the map, um, the opportunities for op operating in the entire Na Nordic airspace with the substantial fleet of fourth and fifth generation fighters and other support aircraft utilizing a distributed base system and sensors, not at least, is obvious. Uh, and to, uh, to uh, uh, state what's been stated several times already, to fully exploit these opportunities, a combined air operations center, or at least a network national air AOCs is required to gain the full potential. And I say at least because it is a way and path forward. It's very well, uh, very good that you have an open-ended uh, incremental approach and a step-by-step -step development. Because uh, the, real, the, the realities will kick in and these, this needs to be uh, developed further in parallel, par parallel with, uh, with the NATO development of ARC2. Uh, and also, um, uh, how NATO will develop to be able to have zero-day response in their standing uh, command and control uh, uh, system. And not at least, it will be a question of facilities, costs, and so on down the road. But uh, the initiative is very, well, uh, is very well welcomed, and a step-by-step -step approach uh, Connecting it together and moving towards having one common AOC is very welcome. I find it particularly interesting to investigate how the differences in the basing concepts, concepts uh, as alluded by, by, to by my colleague Perm Pearson, uh, uh, can be utilized further uh, and building on actually the differences we have with Norway and, and Denmark being concentrated and defended and, uh, and uh, Finland and Sweden uh, resilient and flexible with dis a distributed uh, system because it needs to be a combination. The war in Ukraine has demonstrated the importance of having layered air and missile defense and not at least the risk of not having it to defend uh, critical uh, military and civilian infrastructure. Uh, so the Norwegian perspective is that we need to put a layered air defense uh, system in place. Uh, it is in our long-term plans. Uh, we have critical shortfalls of today, which needs to be addressed. Uh, and uh, obviously there is a potential for cooperation when it when we're moving forward, putting these layered systems in place in each nation. 
Further on, the potential for pooling and sharing capabilities are, which are too demanding for one nation to sustain. For instance, air-to-air refueling, airborne early warning, strategic lift, long-range UAVs uh, should be investigated further. Obviously, we have NATO and multinational uh, initiatives in place already, but there should be and could be room also for Nordic in uh, initiatives as we move forward. When it comes to Spain's domain, I will not touch more upon that. It was very well covered by, uh, by Vidar. Uh, I will end off by st stating that the following year will be very important for Norway. Um, the CHODs will give he, the CHOD, the Norwegian CHOD, will give his uh, military advice uh, end of May. In the same time frame, there's two commission reports coming, one on defense and one on society's total resilience or readiness. And all of these uh, will form the basis for a new long-term plan to be issued in 2024. All of this work will have a strong Nordic cooperation uh, line of effort uh, within it. And just to end off with uh, um, uh, not putting restrictions to, but we need to be aware uh, that um, a common holistic uh, Nordic approach needs to be balanced when it comes to sovereign national interests and not at least the obligations we have towards NATO when it comes to fulfilling NATO Article 3. Each nation's obligation to, uh, to fulfill the defense investment pledge, or rather the new ambition expected from the Vilnius uh, meeting this summer, and not at least also the capability targets uh, needs to be first priority. Saying that, there is possibility to coordinate capability targets and to join forces where we can really strengthen each other, also looking into the potential for pooling and sharing. So in sum, it's great potential for a deeper and broader cooperation when all nations are members of NATO, but we should also be aware and avoid being perceived as a NATO block in NATO. Uh, and the best way of doing that is uh, actually having a strong uh, approach regards to NATO at eventually 32, and also uh, working in different bilateral and multilateral uh, frameworks together or to take care of our own interests. So uh, to end off uh, with my colleague's uh, uh, statement, which I found very good, think big and start small, and step by step, we will develop an even deeper cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much to Norway. We, uh, luckily, our next speaker has already been introduced, and I don't think you have changed that much in the last few hours, sir. Or maybe you have, but uh, in, the, in that case, you have to do that introduction yourself. Here you go. I will spend 19 minutes talking about myself. So, once again, the Swedish perspective, I, and I, I apologize because I will go through my slides pretty fast because I, I counted on 30 minutes and I got 20, so it will be a fast moving PowerPoint presentation. So, I will only highlight some things on, on the, each slide. For example, this is the slide we used for, for a couple of years. The Air Force, we defend Sweden in the air from the ground 24 7, 365. But of course, we should say the Nordic and NATO uh, soon enough. And we have six missions, more or less, and I would like to say that we all do five of those in, in, in peace and crisis, and the six, of course, conduct air to ground and air to sea strikes is purely a, a wartime uh, mission, but we do it. Otherwise, uh, the rest of the things I think all the Air Forces do, really, no matter what country you talk about. I want to highlight one thing. Uh, in Sweden, we always have a discussion if we have a peacetime organization or a wartime organization. We always try to think that it's a very sharp line between those, and then we have discussions whether it is a sharp line between those or not. And this is the difference. This is the wartime, and this is the peacetime. So, 
What is the big difference? Yeah, the commander of the Air Force will be the Joint Force Air Component Commander, together with his ACC, and the small frame to the right there is the former air staff, so to say, who is in charge of the peacetime organization. And during peacetime, we have a small AOC. And how will the wartime look like if we're going to have a physical combined air operation somewhere else? That means that a lot of people from the Air Component Command needs to be somewhere else. And we have thought that the same people will do the same work even during wartime to educate, train people in the same time we do wartime operations. If we send them somewhere else, how do we fix that? It's not, a, it's not an unsolvable problem, but we need to pro look at it. So, so in, in the first step would be to have a combined, <laughs> to connect the different AOCs in, in our four countries and start doing that first before we move too many people away from, from, from because we will have the same problem or in our air forces. If you talk to Ukraine at the moment, they're doing everything at the same time. I had a great uh, honor to welcome some people from the Ukrainian Defense University last week and, and to have discussions with them. And, and the principal or the, or the president of the Ukrainian Defense University, uh, the general, uh, met with my, with the president of the Swedish Defense University earlier, a couple of months ago, and he just came back because he was in charge of the defense of Bakhmut. So all the teachers, they go out, serve at the front line for a couple of months, come back, work at the university for a couple of months, give the latest news back to the students, then go back to the front for a couple of months, and then move back and forth. And, and this is not in my briefing, but this is the situation maybe we have to face when we talk about Nordic Air Forces. Some parts of the Nordic will, will train students. Some countries will fight the war 100%, 24-7. So, and luckily, if you're not in the vicinity of, of the real fighting, of course, Air Forces will be involved anyway. So that is something to think about. Gave me a good perspective when you talk to, uh, to the Ukrainian colleagues. Our operational context really is more or less the same for every country. We are strategically defensive. Uh, the adversary has the advantage of choosing time and place. That's why I think it's necessary to talk about what if, from a Swedish perspective, we have already thought about it, what will happen that during a crisis, someone the adversary sends about 15 cruise missiles at 0100, an ordinary Tuesday. But we'll probably take out 90% of the Swedish Air Force because all the Gripens are in the hangars and they will not withstand the cruise missile attack. So already in the crisis situation, you need to focus on moving the, away from the hangars. And that is one situation that we already train on during after the 24th of February last year. What if the Russians would, would attack Sweden during that time? And we had discussion on how to move the aircraft away from the ordinary hangars. And I think that applies to all the Nordic countries, really. Of course, I have to have a picture of the Gripen. I will not discuss any further except the last line that's partitioned avionics, which we are very proud of to fix. That means that you don't have to have an airworthiness for the whole aircraft if you just fix one part of it. So if you fix the, the avionics with a software update in the morning, we can have it flying later in the afternoon the same day. So that's a, it's a true force multiplier to, to win the war to get more airborne aircraft, really, in, in this situation of war. But this one is, is a true force multiplier. And we have ordered two of these aircrafts. It's a multi-domain airborne early warning, but it's not only airborne, and it's not only for, for, for air targets, it's for sea targets, it's also a ground moving target indicator radar, so you can see, see ground movements. And if you put that aircraft in, in, on the east coast, still over the land territory, you see everything that happens in the, in the Baltic Sea, on the sea, in the air, and if there are driving trucks on the island of Gotland, we will see them too. So this is a magnificent aircraft. Of course, very, very cheap. <laughs> but still, it's good. 
I will come back to it later on. I showed that earlier, I will skip that. Logistics under attack we already talked about. So, the former commander of the Air Force and me when I was deputy, we, we were very humble, so we called it, well, the mission was to create a military problem. Because the predecessor before that, he called the Gripen a true MiG killer. And then he got the personal diplomatic note from the Russian embassy. And then the Kaliwan also had a terrific saying in the newspapers, uh, naming Russia for to be the main enemy. So he also got a diplomatic note. And I said, you have to put him on like a, the wall of remembrance. Because I thought it was great. Not everybody thought that at the moment. But. So this is a typical picture from the Swedish Air Force. We look down, really, to get down to the small area. We look at the Baltic Sea problem, and we try to solve it with the Patriot missiles, integrated air missiles system, together with the Navy, which in the future will have some more advanced air defense problem, uh, missiles, so we can create and, and train on that. We have been training a lot of integrated between the Air Force and the GBAT system, for example, how to engage targets in the Patriot missile range, and can the Patriot take care of that target, and the Air Force takes care of that. And we have been showing PowerPoints for the last 20 years saying it's not a problem, but in real life it is. So that's you need to train on. But of course, this is the map we should use when we talk about today and in the future. And it doesn't matter if it's Gripens, it could be F-35s, it doesn't matter. But this is the way we have to look at it. Because if, for example, Finland is attacked by Russia or the Baltic states, the first thing, I guess, would be to use air power, because we can do it in hours. So if Article 5 is, is, is used, if the terms fail, I think that the, our air forces will be, be the first choice of weapon to, to, to solve that situation or help that country to support against the Russian aggressor. So you need to, we need to fix this, and we need to train on this as soon as possible. And you who are our members of NATO, you know that the Integrated Air Missile and Defense Policy Committee is on the same level as the military committee. So it's a highly uh, prioritized target. We like to always stress that in Sweden because not so many people in Sweden knows that, especially our Navy and, and uh, Army friends. So we need to look at it. And everybody, has, we have more or less talked about all those things. We had strategic depth. I once said on the press briefing that would be perfect if the, if the Nordic countries would turn left 90 degrees. So we had Norway, Finland, and Sweden going west to east, because then we didn't have to have uh, any problems with crossing borders before we met Russia. Some didn't like that either, but um, uh, it is a problem. Space. In Sweden, space is on the tactical level controlled by the Air Force, or, or, or should be, because we are, of course, very, very struggling to, 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 to learn this and be better at using space. But we have a space situation or awareness. We have a space uh, exchange with, with the United States to, to try to get the hold of what is happening in the space arena. And I think all our Nordic friends are, are more or less on the same level, even though I I think that the Norwegian presentation gave that you are ahead of us in Sweden, but we are still struggling a lot. We have never mentioned the enemy on the briefings yet, so this is the enemy. It's uh, uh, an open source because it's the Soviet Union, it's not Russia. This is the way they did their plans, as we all remember who are on my age. Uh, and they always tend to forget also in the middle part of Sweden. Everybody forgets that. We too, and the enemy also. So try to figure out that's the safest piece of land to be in Sweden, somewhere north of Sundsvall, Östersund. Nobody goes there. We need to remember this, I think, sometimes. This is what, where we come from 30 years ago. Finland was east of the border between the Warsaw Block and, and, and uh, NATO. Sweden was in the middle, or more say, but in the future we will be, we will have a lot of NATO countries to the east, which we have never thought about. 
We were a neutral country once, and the biggest joke when I did my conscript service, 1987, was that when the young conscript asked the captain, said, sir, sir, why does the enemy always come from the east? Well, it's too long and too complicated to go around. <laughs> so, so that's about Swedish neutrality, yes. We need to think about this, what, what, what will happen in a NATO perspective, and even as the Vice Admiral say, if something happens between the United States and, and China, what will we do then in, from a Nordic perspective? Of course, we will take charge of the high north, so the United States don't have, have to be there, so they can send their forces to, to, to the Southeast Asia and to, to take care of that. I don't think we will have the capacity to go to Southeast Asia, not Sweden anyway. So you need to look at the map and bigger map and bigger map. That's the biggest challenge at the moment in Sweden when you talk to people because everybody thinks that NATO will come and protect Sweden. And I, we have to say, no, 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 we're going to be NATO. We're not protected by NATO, we are NATO. It's a cultural way of changing minds. So what can we bring to NATO from a Nordic perspective? I think everything has been said already. Uh, Yep, not the least highly skilled personnel. I think all our air forces are highly skilled in the Nordic countries. And we have, a, have a, something to be proud of, but we need to put them together. What Sweden need, please help us become members of NATO as soon as possible. And of course, from the NATO perspective of the US, we need added capabilities, critical enablers, security of supply, endurance, etc., etc because NATO has this great slide. You're gonna outfight, outthink, outpace, outlast, outexcel, and outpartner. That's the solution to everything, isn't it? We need to think. We have some challenges, I would stress. But Wayne Gretzky has solved that. I get to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. So please, let go of history and look forward to a brand new concept. Think new. We have already seen that one, so the conclusions. The Nordic Air Forces are, if together, a formidable and considerable force. We have a strategic or an operational depth when we are all together, but we, not, we need not, not only to focus on the fighters. What about transport aircraft? Why don't we fix, which we also have talked about for 10, 15 years, possibilities with a transport command in peace, crisis, and war? What about if what one or two of our rather many C-130 Hercules can be a tanker? Airborne early warning, Sweden brings two, maybe three in the future to the table. Can't we buy one or two more together? And then we have five Global Eye aircraft. I think a P-8 or a couple of P-8s and a couple of Global Eyes in the high north, we would have complete situational awareness of the high north. Helicopters, we have a different, but still we can have a common training maybe, etc. And we need to use what the concept is called smart defense. We have talked about it already earlier. So we need to start to train on a Nordic integrated air missile defense system, ASAP. Maybe you should not only have a ordinary Arctic challenge exercise, but the Arctic challenge exercise that are focused on integrated air missile and defense. So, Combined joint ops, that's a politically correct answer, and I will say, but first combined air ops, because that is the, worst, the first thing that we can use together in, in, in the Nordic countries, because we need to stop this from happening. Two months of, of con uh, ongoing war in Mariupol, it looks like this, and it's one year ago. We need to stop that from happening anywhere in NATO countries. And that is one mission for the Air Force, I think. A quick, save you some time. And if you figure out some question, I asked my dear good friend, Chet GPT, what is the main objective of a combined Nordic Air Force? And he answered this. That concludes my briefing. Thank you.
that uh, artificial intelligence is not, I mean, some of the answers it might provide is a bit off. This seems to be not too bad, I, I would say. So uh, that's, a, that's a good offer. And uh, this leads us to the final presentation of the day before the panel debate. Um, the final presenter comes from Finland, the newest member of NATO, and a couple of um, and uh, our Finnish colleagues here have shown me some wonderful pictures from the day that they ascended to NATO, uh, flying their F-18s and so on. So it's it's really great to have you on board. Colonel Tommy Heikala, uh, he has joined the Finnish Air Force in 1991 and have had most of his career in the Finnish Air Force. But he's also served other places, including NATO at, uh, at Aircom. He has uh, many flying hours with uh, Drakin uh, F-18 and is currently also flying the PEC-12 and he does so in an absolutely wonderful manner, something I can personally attest to after he did a very silky smooth landing on a beautiful winter morning in Tikakoski in uh, December last year. So that is really something that I can attest to as well. Very, very happy to uh, have you here, Tommy, and I really look forward to your perspective uh, from a Finnish point of view. Here you go. All right, good. Um, sirs, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for uh, your, uh, let's say, flourishing words. Uh, and thank you for the previous uh, uh, briefers on your tons of uh, food for thought for, for us. I've been working with the Nordic AOC working group for one year now, and I think that we have uh, had uh, really good insights and really or many new inputs on, on our work, so thank you for that. Uh, I want to thank Daniel once again for uh, providing me with the opportunity uh, from, uh, with this uh, top-down approach starting with the strategic and the conceptual world, uh, to go down to the tactical level, which is my comfort zone. And I will do that. Uh, so uh, my, intention, uh, my intention is to brief you on, on Finnish Air Force perspective with, with the focus on uh, Nordic Air Sea 2. Uh, but before I go to our tactical level, I would uh, uh, step on the strategical side for a second. And uh, I think that uh, our previous uh, president, Mauno Koivisto, uh, was uh, asked the question that, uh, what is Finnish strategy? And I think that uh, uh, Mauno used to be a blue color guy as well, so really uh, straightforward. And, and the way how he put it, it's, it's simplified, but it's actually telling all the necessary bits and pieces. So, so Mauno said that Finland's strategy is to survive. And uh, <clears throat> if you look at the history, uh, actually after, after the Second World War, we were not put on the best place, uh, but however, we did survive, and I would say that we did succeed in a way. And uh, that that basically is uh, is in our culture, on on our backbone, in a way that uh, we know what our neighbor to the east is, and what it is not. Uh, I think that during the last 700 years, there has been almost 40 armed conflicts between us. None of them uh, were not uh, started by Finns, even though there were allocations on that at some times. And it made me wonder, uh, I guess most of you heard or, or read on the news when uh, Kremlin's uh, spokesperson, Dimitri Peskov, said that uh, uh, they were regretting that Finland will join NATO, uh, since we haven't had any disputes ever. I think that I know quite a many Finns which do not agree on that fact. but. Uh, that's my 50 cents on, on the strategic side, so, so I will dwell onto, onto my comfort zone next. Uh, and I start explaining it by our organization. So uh, a lot of things has been said about how we, how we do the dispersed operations and uh, how the Swedes do and how, how some things are common. Uh, we do have uh, four uh, units, which actually are, are the uh, nesters or the hosters of our main operating base. They do the training and they do have different units within them. Uh, but I would say that they are as well, or their wartime role is, uh, is to be those uh, base groups uh, that Anders mentioned earlier. So they actually do form that main operating base, uh, one deployable base, and uh, send maintainer units to decided locations whenever needed. 
Uh, our uh, peacetime Persian is uh, 3,300. Uh, that includes uh, 1,300 conscripts, so we have stick with the conscript system. Uh, and I think that uh, it's the matter of money, matter of efficiency, and as well matter of culture. Uh, I think that the conscript system uh, does not feed only to our capability. It, it feeds into uh, Finnish uh, population's will to defend. And I think that we are pretty good, good on that, uh, that matter as well. I think that the latest poll said that 95% of Finns would say that we have to defend no matter what is the, what is the uh, adversary. And that makes me really happy. Uh, our Air Force troops during wartime is 25,000, so majority of that is, uh, comes from the reserves. Uh, the fleet is, uh, is shown there, and uh, as mentioned earlier, we're going to fly F-18s uh, till the end of uh, this decade, so uh, the sundown will be 2030, and the first F-35s will uh, fly in 26. IOC is planned to be 28, which means that we can take over QRA and the F-4C at 2030. Uh, yep, that's about it. Uh, the operational environment, uh, and I, I noticed that uh, a lot of the things that I'm uh, managed to say, they have already been said, so I'm going to be brief, but uh, this is our perception on our operational environment. So uh, uh, we are relatively long, uh, north to south, but uh, relatively narrow in east to west. So this has been our operational dilemma for decades or for over ages. And this actually means that we have, uh, we need to uh, consider how to operate under enemy's long range fire and A to AD bubble. Uh, we found our ways uh, how to do it, or that's what we, will, uh, what we believe, that we know how to, how to do that. Uh, it inflicts uh, requirements uh, to our operational concept and our air sea to concept, uh, concept as well. Uh, and I think that uh, now when being a NATO member, uh, as uh, General Deason said, that uh, most likely we will not change our defense concept uh, too much. And I think that uh, the current, current thinking uh, within Air Force is that uh, we need to stick with some portions of that. Uh, of course, there will be uh, there will be freedom of choice whether we're going to deploy some units further further west or further down south, but actually when you're operating within Finland, you need to be uh, alert at all times. Uh, the red bubbles, uh, they are depicting the A280 bubble, and, and the blue bubbles on our side are actually depicting our current capabilities. But as I mentioned, the David Sling uh, purchase will make a difference on that. Uh, operational environment and uh, uh, being NATO, uh, NATO member, of course, we are actually seeking for operational depth uh, in, in many, many ways. And I would say that our Finnish uh, current setup is built uh, with the assumption that we need to uh, step up really quick. Uh, but how long can you sustain that, that uh, thing to go on? It's, it's a matter of... Uh, Let's say that it is built to be, be up really fast manner, but uh, I'm not sure how many months we could uh, sustain it by ourselves. So the joining the alliance is, is actually a really great thing for us. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I think this is a beaten horse, but uh, I, I try to uh, talk it uh, quickly. So. Uh, we actually talk about dispersed ops, uh, but since the Yankees started to talk about the agile combat operations or combat employment, so it's, uh, this is uh, basically the same terminology. But uh, uh, we tend to use our road bases, road strips, our civilian airports, and, and uh, in, in uh, addition to our uh, military air bases. And uh, when looking at the volume, I would say that there are 40 platforms all around Finland that are, uh, can be used for that purpose. Uh, that is one of the cool pictures, by the way, yeah. Uh, the combat employment, of course, uh, it means that our main operating bases, there has to be a lot of uh, optional runaways that you can land on or take off, uh, and that is what uh, how they have been uh, built during the last decades. Uh, and, of course, all of our armament or fuel trucks, etc., they need to be mobile, mobile as well. 
the pictures are showing when our conscripts are actually handling AMRAMs. Uh, and uh, that is one, one example of, of our road trip. Uh, we do uh, train the, uh, that employment annually. And uh, actually there's a qualification for each of our pilots to be landing on a road trip uh, during day and night in order to do it whenever asked. Yep. Then moving on to the C2, which is actually, uh, I would, even though this is a tactical, I want to elevate it because uh, this inflicts on our, on our thinking how the Nordic AOC, uh, sh uh, what are the reasoning behind it or uh, why to do things as, as uh, why to do different, uh, why to do things different than NATO does in, in uh, current form. Uh, so our uh, operational uh, command is divided into two, uh, I would say, uh, divisions. Uh, our A3 is responsible for operational, uh, operational planning uh, and Air Force operations, which actually means that they are running the ground ops uh, within Finland. It means force protection, logistics personnel. Uh, they are responsible for uh, producing the air uh, op plan and AOD. Uh, regional air commands, they are uh, responsible for running the air bases, uh, as, as mentioned, MOBs, FOBs and ROBs. Uh, they do the force protection logistics for IS work and, and uh, personnel and maintenance uh, on, their, on their area of responsibility. Uh, I'm working at the Air Operations Center and uh, we are responsible for planning and C4 of air operations, so what, uh, what happens airborne. Uh, our regional air commands has two CRCs, which are working under my, com uh, not under my command, but uh, when we are talking about how to uh, employ weapons, I have direct linked, or uh, Air Force command, uh, commanders delegated authority to, to task those units. And uh, uh, so CRCs are responsible for tactical C2 uh, as planned and uh, ordered by, by AOC. Uh, why I bring this up is that uh, once you put uh, 25,000 troops, uh, our fleet size, uh, to operate on, on the way that I just depict, uh, it is a circus. There, there's a lot of things to be considered, a lot of things to uh, be uh, taken carefully. So uh, to maintain picture what happens, where it happens, it's, it's a demanding job. And uh, after I uh, worked at the NATO Aircom, and with all the respect to work at the Aircom and the, and the JFAC, I think that this is something that they are not prepared to do. So uh, if we want to keep operating like that, there has to be some way how to see to that system. And I, I think that we are on a spot with the, no uh, with the Nordic community to try to figure out that, uh, what is the way forward. Uh, then, uh, talking about uh, what NATO does, uh, I, th uh, I think that the NATO is a big umbrella uh, which allows us to share info, plan operations together, uh, do capability development together with the NDPP process, uh, train and exercise policy will be common and uh, of course the standards are from there. Uh, ACO, uh, four standards, uh, command structure, standing defense plan shielding and a air policing and, and basic connectivity. Uh, but actually, uh, how I perceive it is that uh, this is only a portion of the whole picture. So uh, I think the Joint Force Command portion was mentioned earlier, uh, and I think that the Joint, uh, the joint Force Command decision is really uh, important for all of us, because that will set the community of interest uh, that you need to train and uh, be able to share, share information with. And, and, uh, uh, I cannot remember who, who mentioned it earlier, but uh, the Finnish perception or a Finnish uh, official statement is that we have to be on the same JFC, so that, that is the minimum. We have not stated which is our favor, but uh, we have to be on the same JFC. Uh, then when thinking about how things might evolve, uh, as we all know, the uh, Article 5 decision might take some time before uh, things uh, can start uh, smoothly running from the NATO side, so you need to have prepared uh, yourself for, for uh, 
Article 3 and maybe coalition of willing operations. And that's something we have to consider as well while, while thinking about the Nordic AOC. And, and the last umbrella is, is the Nordic one, uh, where, uh, where we need to decide C2 structures. Uh, do we need a no physical Nordic AOC or is that uh, virtual enough? And I think that these all umbrellas are linked to each other in a way that you cannot decide that, yes, I'm going to do this, because everything is inter interconnected. Uh, for sure, uh, we need to find ways how to do easy access protocols within our, uh, as, as mentioned earlier, EFOS don't recognize borders, but actually it's not true, because uh, you have to add, add here with the national borders, but we have to find a ways how to do it uh, as easy as possible. Uh, uh, on my scope, uh, how to do targeting, how to do air, la air land integration, of course our operational environment is something that we are not looking too much on uh, air-sea battle, because uh, as mentioned, Baltic Sea is a NATO pond. Yeah. Uh, so our interest is on, a, on a air land integration. Uh, and that's something we need to we need to figure out how to do, how to share information, relevant information with uh, with the team that we are working with. And once again, connectivity is, is one of the keys. Uh, that being said, I think this picture is uh, is been there, or the, or the same info has been there for quite many times. And I I think that. Uh, the potential that we have right now and uh, what the future will bring, it's, it's something that uh, is remarkable. Uh, and when thinking about that Nordic AOC development, I, I would not say that it's competing with the NATO command structure. I think that we, uh, we consider ourselves to be supporting or bringing more security to NATO. And, and that's, that is AOC is or the, uh, or the planning is done for the reason that how do we need to change our ways how to fight and how to see to it in the best way. So by saying that, that's pretty much all from the tactical side, depending on questions. Thank you very much for the Finnish perspective, Tommy. We will do the questions afterwards, but it's uh, certainly clear that uh, while you are just a fresh member into NATO, you certainly bring a lot to the table, and NATO as a community has a lot to learn from you as well. So thank you very much. Over to the next part in our program. We will reconvene in um, 15 minutes, so 10, 10 past three for the panel debate. If bring your questions to me in person, send me a text message, and we will make sure to get this show running. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the end of the road of my active uh, supported involvement in this uh, seminar uh, because we have reached uh, the pinnacle, the panel debate uh, between the different presenters that are on my right side. And luckily, uh, I will now go from being supported to supporting uh, the panel debate leader who will be uh, retired Major General um, uh, Tom Henrik Knudsen, who is standing right here. Uh, the question will still come to me, but I'll leave it to Tom to lead this uh, section. So with that, Tom, please Thank go ahead. You. Thank you very much, Daniel. Yes, I will try to be the moderator for this uh, panel discussion. And um, uh, we will focus on uh, the three panelists and their presentations. However, if there is uh, any afterburner from uh, the audience, concerning the other speakers, then we will also try to uh, accommodate, uh, accommodate those questions. So please um, give um, Daniel the uh, questions at the same number you have been using through the day, and um, we will um, accommodate them uh, as we go along. We will try to finish off at about um, 10 past half, uh, 3.40, so uh, that's about the, the, the time frame. Um, I will start off uh, with a question myself to sort of give you 
a chance to uh, have some opening remarks. And uh, we have heard already today that the Nordic military cooperation has been on the agenda for many years uh, already. Uh, however, as uh, General Deason also alluded to, uh, the tangible results um, are debatable. Uh, not to go as far as he did and call it a failure, however, it, it has been debated uh, whether it has been successful or not. So um, I know you have touched upon this already in your uh, Presentations, however, I'd like you to expand and elaborate a little bit about the following question. Why do you think a NATO membership for all the Nordic countries may be a catalyst for more progress in the cooperation efforts, both acquisition and, and those uh, and training and exercises, but also on the operational planning and execution side? And. Um, the Norwegian general, would you like to start off? Is this on now? There you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very good question. And um, uh, I would start by stating that I don't think in any sort of way Nordefco has been a failure. But uh, the tangible results when it comes to, to uh, common uh, capabilities, uh, armament pro projects hasn't been uh, possible to achieve uh, so far. Um, um, to start off with capability and armament, uh, obviously there is uh, a lot of good work uh, being done in uh, different uh, uh, capability groups in the NORDEFCO uh, arena, but I think a NATO membership will definitely catalyze uh, the uh, coordination because we will be part of the same um, um, defense planning process. Uh, actually identifying the capability targets for every nation. And there we have a huge possibility to, to coordinate uh, and also to look for, for opportunities to, to join forces uh, in the same kind of procurement uh, down to where we can actually do uh, common projects as possibly the, uh, the Nordic uh, form of uh, an aerial early warning system. Um, where I think we have progressed a lot over the last years is um, committing to, um, to agreements uh, operating across, base, across borders uh, in the air domain, uh, operating from each other's bases if necessary. So there's a lot of legal framework already in place. Uh, and obviously, a NATO membership for all will will um, ease the legal work uh, ahead of us, uh, also within the NATO framework. When it comes to training and exercise, I think we have progressed far. Uh, and obviously, uh, being NATO members, there will be more exercises that we can join in on. And I'd, I'll just finish off by uh, the big exercises is one thing, but uh, creating smaller training events uh, is also a way of, uh, of catalyzing the cooperations, as for instance, uh, the Bomber Task Force missions, uh, which is a, a, a great possibility to link uh, several kind of training aims into one uh, event and, uh, and really progressing the way we are interoperable and work together. Thank you. Yeah. Well, no, you have to say something. I have to say something <laughs> as the only non-NATO <laughs> non -NATO member's view on why I want to be a member in NATO. Something like that, yeah. Well, the obvious reason is, of course, uh, for the strategic view and for, for, the, for the defense of Nordic countries together. But, but looking at the question you asked, I hope that uh, membership will bring us even more closer on a legal matter, so, so we don't have the same problems uh, from, from a legal perspective for air policing, etc. So and I think that will help a lot. Uh, and I hope that there also the, some kind of acquisition programs will be a little bit easier when they are done inside of NATO instead of that 
two nations, oh, sorry, not nowadays, but two nations outside and two inside, and now it's three inside and one outside. I hope when we're all members that that will be much, much easier to move forward. I hope. Thank you. Okay, uh, I concur with everything which is said earlier. Uh, I think that uh, NATO membership will be a great catalyst for cooperation and uh, it uh, requires us uh, to, sh uh, to change secret information. We're going to be part of the same family of plans, which actually is going to provide more meat to the bone of exercises. So we actually have a operational plan that we need to train and educate our C2 and, and soldiers with. So uh, that helps us to identify possible gaps and uh, make plans how to, how to fill those gaps. So I, I think that this is a great uh, catalyst for cooperation in many ways. Okay, thank you. Um, just to mention it, if um, you want to comment on something you, some one of your uh, Nordic colleagues are saying, just please raise your hand. You don't have to use the phone to, <laughs> to write a question. Just raise your hand, the old-fashioned way. Just add uh, yeah. a couple of, of um, points that is obvious. Connectivity will be much easier because we will be on the same CIS platforms. And of course, uh, security classification levels and so on, which has been a, a hindrance for how far we have been able to operate so far. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, one comment for the, for the information changing is that uh, I think that we've been uh, concentrating on the fact that uh, can we share this? Can we not? And I think that as uh, allied nations, we should concentrate on what we cannot share. Everything else should be shared. Yeah, good point. Okay. Daniel, do you have anything in your feed? Yes, I do. Uh, the yeah. first question today comes from Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace uh, with uh, Bjorn Hulem. Uh, the question uh, statement is this with a following question. question. Joint acquisitions have not been very successful between the nations, but will have large benefits in many, area, many areas such as interoperability, training, logistics, etc. How do the Nordic nations see the possibilities in having cooperation on defense acquisitions in the near future? All right, near future, okay. Yeah, Sweden, go ahead. I'm really hoping. No. I'm really looking forward for the, for the possibilities, and I think there are a lot of possibilities to do that uh, uh, from a personal view. Uh, for example, uh, new helicopters could be something, and I know we, instead of buying like four, or six, or eight uh, specific uh, helicopters from the United States, it's much cheaper to buy 12 or 14 and then divide them afterwards. And, and another acquisition program that we have already decided is, the, is the, before we were even NATO members, is, is the uniform. We have the same Nordic battle dress uniform from, from that's going to be delivered. And also we have going to buy the same uh, fine caliber machine guns, etc., together with, with Finland. So there are some specific acquisition programs that are already moving forward. But from the Air Force perspective, uh, helicopters, transport aircraft maybe in the future, in 10, 15 years after the, the Hawks are finished flying, maybe we can look at trainers also, for example. Mm. Some examples. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, the future for uh, cooperation on that, on that uh, foray will be much more brighter than it has been. So there are a lot of opportunities and possibilities to do things together. But uh, one has to be realistic on the fact that actually pr procurement is really hard business. It's really a complicated process. There are a lot of interests uh, uh, lined up with the national decision making or, or uh, how to say, uh, economic side of the house. And, and then when uh, managing the requirements, what to purchase, uh, we have not been too good on that. I don't want to mention that helicopter name again. Never. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I suggested a new one. <laughs> okay. 
this is not my field of expertise, but uh, uh, to address it back to industry, I think it's important uh, that industry also joins up uh, to, to suggest uh, projects that can be uh, common in, for the Nordic nations, but also uh, other uh, um, uh, partners uh, as such. Um, um, the principal approach to this is to uh, minim minimize the uh, national specific requirements uh, on future uh, acquisition projects and to, to buy uh, standardization, standardized uh, uh, options that are uh, easy to connect uh, with the in-place uh, um, programs and, and structures that we have. Uh, obviously, I mentioned the NDPP pro process. Uh, the other factor, without being an expert on this, is uh, the European Defence uh, Fund uh, organisation, which we all uh, are members of, uh, and the necessity for European industry also to to join together uh, to to make sure that we uh, narrow the number of different. Uh, uh, types of equipment uh, that is uh, it's really a, a, a big challenge for, for Europe today. Um. Yeah, good, thank you. Um, it's a little bit unfamiliar, I have to admit, not to look out in the audience to see some raised hands and new questions. Uh, however, Daniel, I guess you have some raised hands in your uh, electronic I, feed. I do, you? because we are improvising, adapting and overcoming the challenges of uh, being hybrid. I mean, we have um, more than the number of total uh, personnel present here have been watching online from today, so to increasing the number to above 200, so that is quite uh, good. The next question is coming from uh, Svein Holtan, who is the editor of the Nordic Air Power Journal, a magazine I highly recommend. Um, Norway have experienced a very high degree of security restrictions operating F-35s. How will this work for Finland's concept with dispersed basing? I guess that's primarily to Finland. Yeah, I guess so too. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, excellent question. <clears throat> and uh, I think that uh, policies right now, uh, they don't uh, they don't hinder us from uh, using that mobile concept. Uh, or they might hinder, but they, we can do it, yeah. nevertheless. Uh, there are issues that uh, needs to be solved uh, in a way that uh, uh, the typical US way how to operate it, it it's like uh, there's one airbase and one squadron operating out from that. Uh, our way how to employ air power is a bit different, and we have to find the right solutions how to utilize F-35 uh, within Finnish airspace and, and our air bases. Uh, I'm uh, really much leaning forward that uh, we can operate F-35 with the same concept that uh, we have done with the F-18s. Uh, however, I'm really happy that we have uh, military aligned and uh, there are other options as well in our, in our disposal. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Does any one of you want to comment on that, or that's okay? Yeah. Okay, Daniel, continue if you have any more questions. I do have a couple of more. Uh, the next question is from Jon Koski from Northrop uh, Grumman um, for the panel, but I will um, dare to answer it partially myself. The NATO Alliance Future Surveillance and Control Program is planned to be NATO's multi-domain solution to replace the NATO AWACS fleet. Has it been discussed that a Nordic AOC can be part of the Alliance Future Surveillance and Control capability? And from the working group's perspective, the answer is uh, no, it uh, has not, but I suppose we will consider that, and I would propose that the panel can consider if there is any merit to that. Okay, anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, okay. Hey, Kala, go on. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned on my brief, uh, there are different uh, venues where uh, ARC decisions are made, and they are all linked together. So uh, I think we have to consider that, but actually the, the decisions are uh, made somewhere else. Uh, we can contribute to that decision making, but we are only five nations, uh, so let's see how, it, how well it goes. But uh, that's one of the options that uh, has to be studied. Right, good. 
Yeah, if you still have some questions. I, we, I, still, uh, I still have a few before you can delve into your little bank of... Okay, I have some uh, in reserve if yep. necessary, yeah. I will do one uh, more, and it's actually from myself. Uh, so Vice Admiral Breckenridge, he listed a number of challenges uh, that included lack of air-to-air -air refueling, limited uh, AEW, and reconnaissance aircraft. This is, of course, a challenge that also could constitute an opportunity with the joint acquisition that was just discussed. To what extent do you think your nation would have, A, the will, and B, the ability to pull together to mitigate that gap? All right, you go ahead first. Well, in my presentation, I, I gave a Swedish solution on, on the airborne early warning aircraft, and also gave a solution that if we brought all our C-130 together, maybe we could take one or two of those to, to put on air-to-air -air refueling capability. I mean, we have one of our Swedish C-130 that we can train on, but it's not enough fuel to use for an air-to-air -air refueling mission, but we can train on that C-130 aircraft. And, and, and uh, so, so if we have like, you have five in Norway and four in Denmark, and we have six C-130s, so we can just buy two more together for air-to-air -air refueling or, or, or use two of those for, for, for a multi-mission C-130. That's my suggestion really to, to move forward and maybe get more global eyes or, or whatever you think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Skinnala, you want to comment? <laughs> Um, obviously, these uh, gaps are critical to fill, uh, and there are in the, the NATO programs, uh, and multilateral existing programs to do this. For instance, the uh, MRTT uh, multilateral uh, uh, cooperation for uh, air to air refueling. Uh, that's the way Norway do, does it today, uh, even though with a very small amount of hours. Uh, it's a possibility to step up uh, that cooperation uh, if we should move into a Nordic-specific air-to-air refueling capability. Uh, from an air power point of view and to fill those gaps, obviously, uh, but it will be in uh, competition with a lot of other necessary critical shortfalls to, to invest in. So, um, but the, and when it comes to airborne early warning, it's very interesting to look at the, uh, the Swedish capabilities to, to complement the existing and future AVAX fleet. Uh, and when it comes to strategic lift, uh, obviously also multinational uh, cooperation, but also what, what is possible in a Nordic uh, frame. Uh, interesting to look at. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, all of those capabilities are uh, necessary for modern air warfare. However, uh, when comparing our economic size, I think that uh, we could not host everything by ourselves. So I think that there has to be pooling and sharing uh, for at least for some of those. Uh, I think that the, uh, EW uh, will look much more better uh, when, uh, when we hit the next decade. Uh, the Global Eye project, it's uh, interesting to see how, how does that go, but uh, for air-to-air -air fueling, I guess that could be something uh, which is not at least on, uh, on Finnish national uh, point of relevance at, at this point. So pooling or sharing mechanisms in, in order to do, most likely via NATO, uh, NATO defense planning process. Good, thank you. Do you have any more questions? Maybe also some afterburners for some other speakers? I, I do, actually. Yeah. I do have one for Vice Admiral Breckenridge, if, uh, if that's okay. Um, I'll provide the question, and then, and then Dom will provide the, the microphone. Uh, the question is from Colonel Peter Greberg from Swedish Air Force, um, and it's uh, regarding the challenges to the concept slide that I also referred to. Uh, the bullet number five, proximity and increased Russian threat to Finland equals an increased threat to NATO and risk for an Article 5 situation. Could you please elaborate your thoughts on that? Have the risk for an unfavorable situation increased or are, have our deterrence increased with the Finnish membership, mitigating Rus Russian potential aggression? I'll just stand up to look at the cameras. Um, it's a great question, excuse me. <clears throat> the, um, you know, without, without question, um, if I'm Russia, I think the two, after Ukraine, um, 
Poland and Finland are, are probably the, you know, the next area of focus. The question, earlier question today uh, was uh, how long will it take for Russia to recapitalize? I think that's going to be a while. Uh, but nonetheless, they've made some pretty uh, bold statements against both Poland and Finland, as Finland has joined NATO. So, you know, get, given uh, the geography as shown, you know, that Eastern Front uh, is, is going to become more contested and, and having uh, battle space awareness as to uh, movement of threat and, um, you know, uh, how, how we go ahead and deter that behavior is going to be critically important. We had, we had another discussion uh, on, the, on the break about, again, um, often we look at these things traditionally, uh, you know, based on centuries of, uh, of history. Um, but, but, you know, uh, Russia certainly has the ability to do the end run and, um, and not just, uh, you know, attack from the east uh, onto, onto Finland's um, border there. But nonetheless, I, I think that part of the solidarity of, um, you know, this uh, Air Commander's Agreement is uh, we're, we're, it's not just Finland. We're, we're all together. We're going to pool, pool resources together, land-based radars, um, uh, how we uh, integrate and synthesize that for a common operating picture to go ahead and deter is going to become increasingly important um, post-Ukraine for sure. I'm not sure if that fully addressed it, but that's uh, subject to any follow-on uh, there. That's, that's what I got. Thank you. Okay, we have, still have time for a couple of more uh, questions. So I don't know, um, Daniel, do you still have some? I just piece? received a new one. So okay, yeah, look good. at me, it's a two-part question. Go ahead. And it is from um, Anders Brunvald from the Swedish, uh, Swedish Air Force. Um, so with a future Nordic concept with tons of fighter aircraft, they can be designed with a higher ambition to influence the adversary on his own territory in case of a conflict. Obviously, this requires coordination between sea, deed, uh, air interdict, etc., to achieve the desired effect. Is that kind of offensive operations possible from dispersed air bases? And the following question is: Isn't a new Nordic concept with the current available air bases already a really complex military problem for Russia? And our focus should more be on how to defend them. So, two-part question. One, is offensive op operations possible from dispersed air bases, and shouldn't we rather focus on just maintaining what we have? Yeah, very relevant question, I would say. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Anders, for that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a very, very good and interesting question, really. And uh, uh, fr fr from the Swedish perspective, how to handle dispersed spacing, that is not a, a problem, really, because we have we have put put that kind of, of training together even during the Cold War when when you collected different fighters from different air bases to form form a, a combined air operations more or less on, on mainly during that time on anti-surface operations in, in in the Baltic Sea, for example. So so I don't think that is it's a problem, but it's it's done. So it, it's it's not in any way a, a, a true problem really, if I'm honest. Yeah, if I may, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I think that it's uh, doable from a uh, dispersed uh, basing concept, but of course the more sophisticated plan you need to come up with, uh, that challenges that dispersed uh, model. In, in a way that uh, there, there might be certain uh, mission types that you can run from uh, dispersed uh, basing option, but uh, the more complicated planning you have to go into, uh, I think that it has to, the best way to do it is face-to-face. You can do it over net, uh, but uh, most likely there might be some missions that has to be uh, planned in a really detailed manner, and that uh, that maybe may, maybe requires you to go plan it somewhere else, or not not closer than 500 miles from fault line. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, thanks. We have time for one more question. Do you have any more in your... I just received it about a few seconds ago. Okay, so well then uh, that will be the, uh, the final question for the day then. And it okay. should be a short one. It's another question from Jonkowski from Norfolk Grumman. Is there opportunity for Nordic cooperation for ISR or reconnaissance capabilities for the high north or and Baltic regions? Anyone want to address that? Yeah. 
is there opportunity for Nordic cooperation for ISR or reconnaissance capabilities in the high north and Baltic regions? Uh, I would say yes, obvious. Uh, uh, Maybe particularly uh, in the unmanned uh, uh, se segment, uh, um, Norway is uh, is looking to uh, to purchase medium or long range uh, UAVs, and uh, and obviously that will be a very interesting uh, uh, arena to to look further into how we could cooperate uh, uh, filling that gap. And uh, add on on that, I think we could uh, cooperate also in space regarding surveillance in, in the high north and, and uh, in, 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 uh, if you lo look at low, low orbit, uh, it's more like a high altitude UAV really, <coughs> if you go into the low orbit area of, of space. So you could also have a cooperation rather cheap uh, to, have, to have a lot of uh, satellites in that area. Uh, yeah, I would definitely say that there is a possibilities, uh, opportunities that should be exploited, uh, once again being realistic. Uh, realistic. Uh, our intel agencies, they tend to keep the information by themselves and it's uh, extremely uh, difficult for them to share it. And I think that when doing it uh, multinationally, it's going to be, it, it's going to require a change of mindset uh, on information sharing, collecting, analyzing and, and sharing it. Uh, I warmly welcome it. I hope that I can see it before I will be retired. But I, I would appreciate that effort very, very much. Very good. All right, that's about what we um, had time to do. I thank the panelists for very frank and uh, relevant uh, answers to also some very good questions. Uh, and I'm a little bit um, surprised and also uh, impressed that uh, the electronic way of asking questions really worked. So that's about <laughs> also uh, progress, I guess. Okay, thank you very much. I hand it over to you again, Daniel, to finish off the conference. Yes, I don't, I don't have a lot to say before I hand it over to the chairman of the Air Force Association, who will then hand it over uh, to another one after, after that. But I would like to thank you all for your participation. And it is useful, I think it was mentioned or at least alluded to earlier, that even though we exist in a new strategic reality, our culture does not adapt as, as quickly as that. A uh, good saying is that uh, at culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's certainly true, and it will take some time for us to really take this all in. Uh, but with that, once again, thank you all. Uh, Ulian, would you like to do something? <laughs> I use the mic. Um, yes, uh, I would like uh, first of all to thank uh, all of you here uh, for coming in today and also uh, you people watching uh, from uh, online. Thank you. And especially thank you for the speakers. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, in the Air Force Association, we have made some uh, AFA uh, coins. So uh, it's in Norwegian, um, but uh, well, the backside is uh, English, so you can read it. But <laughs> so it's a uh, well. Y y I don't uh, believe you see all this, but uh, in the front it's uh, LMS uh, logo. On the backside is uh, the logo of uh, the Royal Air Force Association. So it's kind of uh, combines our history. So I start with you, uh, Vice Admiral. Here we go. Thank you for your time. And our Finnish representative, thank you for your time. Thank you. And Sweden, good luck with your NATO uh, application. Major Shinran, 
Thank you for your time. And from uh, outer space, Williamson, thank you uh, for your time. And the last one is for our uh, mastermind, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Weig Eriksen. You have um, guided us through this uh, seminar on an excellent way, I would say. So you uh, very much earned this coin. Thank you. And that's all from me, so I will uh, give the last words to uh, Jordan. Th 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 thank you. Uh, and uh, fr from the Air Warfare section of the Royal Swedish Academy of War Sciences, I would like to thank Luftmilitär Samfund. Uh, it has today been talked about how difficult Nordic cooperation is. But for, for my section, this cooperation has been very easy. We have just been sitting back seat and not touching any equipment. <laughs> and and we, we will discuss, uh, the, the leadership of, of the Air Warfare section will discuss with Luftmilitär Samfund strategy department uh, how, how we develop our cooperation. And a first step is that we will send an invitation to our air, air powers uh, seminar, which will be held May 3rd, and it will be possible to uh, attend online. And as a small token for our, our appreciation, I will send the chairman uh, our new publication, a book on drones, which I will get from the publisher or, or the printer later this week. And, and I hope also we can develop this cooperation. And Luftled, the, the, the magazine, is a very important thing. So we can keep the debate going. And thank you very much. <laughs>